Hello, in this part of the course, we're going to be moving into a new section, which is machine learning. Um, there's a lot of material we're going to cover, uh, but at the same time, it's really uh, the tip of the iceberg for all the material you can do in this field. Um, let me try to start by relating to something that we're familiar with, um, and then connect it to something new we're going to be doing, which is building models. So all of you have been running functions for a long time, right? So, hey, maybe I'll write this code, and then our function take inputs, maybe in the form of parameters. And then they have some outputs. Maybe I mean they're printing something or, or I might return a value. And so, for example, I can imagine that um, a function could be doing something like making some sort of prediction. Maybe my input is that I have some details about a house that's for sale. And then I might be predicting um, what it might sell for. And so when I have a function like this, that's an example of a model. And, um, and I could imagine having it feed in a bunch of values at the same time and making a bunch of predictions. So the idea of machine learning is that instead of having a computer write these, or instead of having a human write these functions, we're going to have a computer um, automatically generate these functions. And the way they're going to do that is they're going to learn by example. So we'll feed in a bunch of training data where we have um, a bunch of different houses that have sold for different amounts and have different bedrooms and baths. We're going to try to infer things like, well, how much is a bedroom worth? How much is a bath worth? Um, how, how useful is it to have a newer house? And then based on that function, we're going, to be able to, um, we're going to be able to generate that function and then use that to make predictions on other um, data. And you can imagine why that might be useful for a lot of things. Maybe you're doing property assessments or uh, maybe you're a realtor and you're trying to figure out how to pr price a house properly. So the example I've given here is, is um, an example of a regression model. Um, and, uh, and a regression model is kind of more broadly a type of supervised machine learning. Um, which is one of the main three categories of machine learning. So I'm going to start broad now and talk about these three areas, and then we're going to be talking about regression in more detail, and I'll actually explain um, what it is. So the three main areas of machine learning are reinforcement learning, um, which is basically a situation where you have to make a series of decisions, and you're trying to optimize some sort of reward. So you can imagine some sort of robot moving around in the world and picking up coins or something like that. Um, we're not going to be doing that kind of, um, of work in, in this class. Instead, we're going to focus on two um, areas, which are supervised machine learning and uh, unsupervised machine learning. And in both of these cases, we just have all our data up front, and we're trying to um, gain information about that. Um, some people will say there's a fourth category of um, machine learning called super semi, uh, super, super semi-supervised, um, but we won't be talking about that here. Um, within supervised machine learning, there are two different um, things that we're going to learn this semester. One is regression, and, and with regression, um, we're trying to predict a quantity. And then with the classification, we're going to try to predict a category. So in any of these cases where we're trying to predict something, um, that's known as a supervised problem. And, um, and the way it works is, well, the data we have has some labels on it. Usually there's some special column that's telling us you know, a quantity, like the price for a house or some sort of category. And then from that, we can try to predict that label in cases where the label is unknown. In unsupervised learning, there is no special um, label column that we're trying to predict. We're just trying to look for general patterns in the data. And so we might do a couple things. One, we might try to cluster our data where we're placing rows into different groups. Or we might de try to decompose our rows. We might notice that um, you know, I might have these rows which each, each have five numbers in them. Uh, but maybe um, every row is like a combination of kind of two component rows. And so there's some simplicity in there, even though there might be a lot of columns in our data. So I'm going to go through these four types of things that we're going to learn this semester and, and just try to make it uh, more concrete. So here I have a table, right? This is just a regular data frame. And so this is my index here. Um, here are my column names. Um, right now I have a Y column, which is my label. So that's going to be generally what I'm trying to predict. And then I have these different um, columns here that, uh, that I, I guess I'm just calling them x0 through x4, but usually those would have some sort of real name, right? Like before I saw that we have like the number of beds in a house. Um, so this label that we're trying to predict is what we're going to try to do is look for a relationship between that and these other columns, which we're going to call features. And so in general, what will happen is that we have some examples, some rows where we have examples of both. And then there might be some other um, data where we only have the features, but we don't have um, the Y label. And so we want to try to uh, predict what should draw in here. And, and you can imagine why that might be. Maybe these are all different um, houses, and some of them have already sold, so we know what they sold for. And then these have not gone on the market yet, so we're trying to predict, well, what would they sell for um, if they do go on the market? Right. So the, the problem here with regression, I just want to state again, is that we want to predict a quantity the Y column in this case, based on the features, right? And by a quantity, I mean, this is like a number. 
Um, so how are we going to do that? Well, uh, we might actually break it down into three parts. First, we might um, select a subset of the data that we, um, for which we know the answer. And then we might leave some other data aside for which we also know the answer. And what we'll do is we'll run an algorithm that is able to infer what the relationship is uh, between these features and these labels. Once I've done that, I might run my model on these other ones for which I also know the answer. Now, of course, I already know the real answer. And um, unless my model is perfect, it's probably going to give me somewhat different answers. And so why would I do this? Why would I want to make a prediction if I already know the answer? And the reason is that I can do this to evaluate my uh, model, or, or I might say test my model. Um, so for example, if my model says that um, this row should have been 70 and it's actually 72, well, that's an error. Same thing here, 60 versus 59, that's an error. And I can try to quantify all of these errors and then give my model some sort of um, score, right? That's the testing phase. So after that, after I've learned my model up here and then I've kind of evaluated it on some known cases, then I might actually put it um, in production. Production means I'm using it for real things and I'm trying to predict actual um, unknowns in the world. Um, like for example, if I add a new house to the market, what, what might it sell for? And I could try to put these different values there. Um, another thing we might do uh, even beyond making predictions is that I might look at that model and just try to learn things about the world. Um, so I keep going back to the example where we're selling houses. Um, I think it's interesting to just know, well, for each additional house or for each additional bedroom or bathroom I have in my house, um, how much does that increase the value of my house? And I could use that to make different decisions, right? Like maybe um, I want to do a housing remodel. Um, am I going to get more benefit by adding another bathroom or, or another uh, bedroom? Right, so we, we can just kind of learn things about the world and also make decisions in that way. Okay, so all this was regression, which was um, the first kind of supervised learning uh, we're going to learn this semester. Um, and when we're doing um, these regressions, right, the key thing that makes the regression is that we're trying to predict some quantity in our Y label. Now, it's totally possible that our features might be a mix of both quantities and categories, right? So something like green, red, blue is a category. Something like shape is a category. A lot of things that are strings are categories. Um, that's fine, right? The distinguishing characteristic of a regression is that the, the label column is quantitative. If I somehow am working on a problem where my Y is categorical, then this is no longer a regression. It's a classification um, problem. But otherwise, all these other things I've been talking about where I, I kind of do training and testing and then I put in production, all of that is the same. We're just dealing with categories instead of, um, um, instead of quantities. Okay, so moving on, we saw the two kinds of, um, of supervised learning, which is both um, regression and, and classification. What about unsupervised learning? Um, the main thing here, the main point is that there is no uh, label column, right? I just have a bunch of features. And, um, and then I can try to still learn some patterns about this, even though I'm not trying to predict anything. And, and so one of the things I might want to learn is, well, are there any sort of natural groupings of these rows? And so there are algorithms out there that will, um, let's say, put all these rows into three groups. And I might assign them numbers like 0, um, 1, and, and 2, right? And then just to kind of draw what that looks like, well, all of these rows um, belong together. Now, I really want to stress here that there is no data out there that tells me what the proper grouping is or even how many groups there are. Um, so when I'm doing this, it's not exactly like there's one right answer. Um, but that doesn't mean that all groupings or classifications are equal. Um, I can measure within a group how similar um, those rows are to each other if I have some metric for that. And so then my goal is to have a grouping that uh, kind of maximizes the similarity within each group. And there might be different um, groupings that are equally good, right? But as long as I'm kind of having a high similarity within groups, well, then I still learn something um, meaningful. And you can imagine lots of different reasons I might do this. Like maybe each of these um, things uh, represent a different user um, for my web application. And if I can say, hey, well, there's these 10 different kinds of um, web users for my application, I could maybe run a different uh, marketing campaign um, for each of these different groups. Okay, so clustering again is unsupervised. It's unsupervised because while well, there was no label column I'm trying to predict. Uh, the last kind of machine learning problem we're going to talk about this semester, and uh, which is probably the most complicated, is called a, a decomposition. And, and decomposition is also unsupervised, is again, right, there's no column I'm trying to predict here. And the idea with the decomposition is that I'm going to look through all these rows 
and see if there's any pattern. Are there kind of a, a, a couple archetype rows that, that really can be mixed together to create other things? So, so maybe what I see is that um, with some small error, most of these rows are just combinations of these three um, rows over here, and I would call these my component rows. So you notice the columns are the same, right, between my original data and my component rows. And then to get this row here, like negative 11, negative 7, 3, 20, 20, um, what I would do is I would multiply this row by negative 11, and then add it to 21 times this row, and then add it to negative 8 times this row. All right, so I'm kind of taking a weighted average of these three rows um, to produce this, this row. And if you actually crunch these numbers, you'd see that I would do something kind of similar to this, but um, there would be some error, right? It's not a perfect match, which is um, which is fine. I mean, the fewer components I have, well, then I can have a simpler model, but while well, there might be more error. Um, so, so I have that here, and right? I have these numbers here. And what we'll generally do when I'm trying to mix these components to create a row is I'll put these numbers in another table um, down here. Um, so this will be a table of all my weights, or maybe my principal component um, uh, scores. And so I'll put you know negative eleven here. 21 here, and then negative 8 here. And then for this next row down here, right, I'll do the same thing. I'll say a negative 43 here, 12 here, and then the negative 6 here. And, and so since I'm doing this, I'm putting kind of these mixtures for every row down here, down here. What that means is that um, if there's um, n rows over here, then there are also going to be n rows over here. If there are um, m columns over here, well, then there would be m columns over over here. So basically what I can do is I can take this big table and I can uh, reduce it to having some components here and I can have some weights here. It's useful for lots of things. Um, one is just if I'm trying to uh, uh, save space on my on my storage system, right, it, I can have these things be smaller. Uh, but then it's also nice if I'm trying to do other phases of machine learning, like a classification or regression, it's kind of nice if I only have like three feature columns instead of the original Five. That's trying to help me in, in a number of cases. Okay, so that's a whirlwind tour of these four problems we're going to solve: regression, classification. Those are both supervised because, again, it's labeled clustering decomposition. There is no column we're trying to predict, so that's unlabeled. It's unsupervised um, learning. And um, and so for each of these four things, there's actually a ton of different um, algorithms out there. And uh, and in this semester, we only really have time to learn like one algorithm for each of them. And so if I go to this website down here, this is the website for scikit-learn, which is the module we're going to be learning. And, um, and there's probably close to hundreds of different um, algorithms or different classes they have there. I put a small subset under here. And, and so I can see, well, here's all these different things they have for clustering. And we're going to just learn one of those, which is k-mean, k-means clustering. Decomposition, all these different things I can do we're going to learn just one of them, which is PCA. Um, it turns out that for a lot of um, algorithms, the uh, the classification and regression come in pairs. So for example, here I have like a decision tree classifier. Here I have a decision tree regress regressor. Here I have a k-neighbors classifier. Here I have a uh, k-neighbors regressor. And that's why I didn't uh, kind of split these out. I just put both of these under, under these two categories. And so we're going to learn two things here. We're going to learn logistic um, regression. And we're going to learn linear regression. And this is a little bit confusing because, well, this part's obvious, right? The linear regression is trying to be a, a regression here. This is the one that people get confused on because even though it says regression in the name, it is not a regression. It's actually a classification, right? So these are the four things we're going to be learning this semester. And logistic regression is one people always get confused on because, well, it's not actually a regression. And I think once we learn all these things, the very nice thing is that um, the interface to using the other ones is relatively simple. So for example, once you know how to use a linear regression, um, you could very easily just replace the word linear regression with ridge, and, um, and you're still going to be able to do all your machine learning stuff uh, correctly. Now, before you do that, you should probably learn about how ridge works and then think about which model is best for you. But at least in terms of the code, it's very simple to switch between different models um, within any, any of these four categories. So I want to talk a little bit, that was pretty high level, I want to talk a little bit about the foundations where I need to um, be learning this machine learning, both in terms of the code and then also the math. Um, we're going to learn a few different modules. The, the main one is at scikit-learn. Um, I was just showing some documentation from scikit-learn. 
Um, we're also going to learn NumPy, which has um, lets us deal with matrices. It turns out that NumPy, um, uh, NumPy is uh, really the foundation for pandas, right? All, all pandas data is actually stored in NumPy, and uh, and now will be a good time for us to actually see that. Um, and then we're going to learn this thing called PyTorch, and, and PyTorch um, can do a couple of things for us. One is it can do calculus for us, which is pretty cool. Um, another thing it can let us do is it can actually let us run our code on uh, GPUs, which are graphics processing units. Um, everything we've been running so far this semester has been running on CPUs, right, your central processing unit. And, um, and it turns out that GPUs that are originally built for graphics are also happen to be really good at machine learning. And so a lot of things, if you're dealing with a lot of data or kind of complex models, a GPU will be better at it. We're going to have to learn a little bit of math. I'm not assuming you have any uh, math background be, besides what you might learn in, in high school. Um, but let me give you an example of how math is going to come into play here um, for a regression problem. right? So we have this example again with all the houses and these characteristics. And then we have a function that predicts the, the price. Um, how would we do that with matrices? Well, I might take all these numbers in a data frame and, and put them in this matrix here. And then for my function, I may have um, Kind of just an algebraic expression which is using matrices so my x here is this matrix um, c is a vector uh, b is just a number and when i run this well i'm going to get these other this other vector out here which actually has all the all the prices right so to understand what's going on here uh, we have to learn a little bit of linear algebra right this is not a regular multiplication it's actually something called the the dot product and it looks like this right i can take this um, x matrix here uh, dot product it with this vector and then add a number and then that's how I'm going to get my my results over here on the right hand side to do one prediction right and what's cool right is that if I can do one row times um, times this vector here and I get um, one house value and it's just going to go through um, kind of without having a loop even right the beauty of linear algebra and multiplying matrices together with the dot product is that I can do it one step and I'm going to get actually all of these numbers the code for it is pretty simple. Um, if I say data frame dot values, then um, x is actually going to be um, a NumPy array. And if I want to, I can just say, well, I want the dot product of these two things, and I want to add b, and, and it just works. So we're going to be talking about that in quite a bit more detail um, at some point before the end of the semester. Um, one thing I want to note is that if you're reading other documentation, um, a lot of resources will use A instead of X, which I find confusing. I think that's not intuitive if you're kind of you know working in all of these scikit-learn modules because those will generally use X for data. And then even stranger, right? We'll often have a C when we're in scikit-learn, but then they call that little X instead. So just be, you know, as we're learning linear algebra stuff, I just want to say up front and I'll say it again, uh, be aware that the variable names are a little bit wacky. Um, so what is kind of the scope of linear algebra and what kind of things are we trying to solve? Well, one thing that we're not going to solve is something like this, y equals x squared. That is not linear, right? Anything quadratic or cubic or anything like that, uh, um, not linear. Really, all we can do is multiply um, uh, multiply variables by numbers and then add things up, right? So this is an example of a, of a linear equation, right? I just have, um, uh, I have some different variables, right? And then I'm, I'm multiplying them by different numbers. One of the things we're going to notice is that um, the way we're going to be doing linear algebra in this course is we actually have very big matrices and, and a lot of variables and a lot of equations, right? So you can see here I actually have 50 um, variables. So I think the key takeaway is that um, more variables, more data, but simpler equations. Uh, what about calculus? So, so here I have that situation again with the house where I have some training data. So I have both my features and my label. It goes into an algorithm, and that algorithm will basically spit out this... Um, this formula for me that I can use to predict housing prices, right? Now, it turns out that um, when I was doing this training, right, I had the original prices, and the new prices might be a little bit different, right? This is 140, this is 190, 240, 254, right? They're all a little bit different. And, and so what I can do is, for this given um, equation I end up with, I can have some sort of function called a loss function that compares the correct answer with my model's answers, right? So I, I compare these two and I get one number out, right? That's kind of like what my error is or how bad it is. And um, and of course, how bad it is really depends on, on kind of the numbers that are part of this equation 
um, down here. So the whole idea of this training thing with this algorithm is that I want to find out, well, what C can I do that is going to make um, my error, my loss, um, as small as possible, right? So we're trying to minimize something. And, um, and I don't expect you've taken calculus, but I know a lot of you have. And in calculus, we're often trying to minimize or maximize things. And, uh, and that's why it's trying to come into play a little bit here. The good news is that we don't have to understand calculus. There's going to be um, modules that can do it um, for us, such as this PyTorch thing that we're going to be learning. Um, PyTorch is also going to help us um, uh, be able to run our code on, on GPUs. We're going to be able to do things like take two matrices, um, shove them over to a GPU, and then multiply them together. And um, it'll just kind of it almost feel like it's just magically going faster than it would if we're running on a, on a CPU. Um, and it doesn't take a lot of code to um, to move it around. So PyTorch is going to be very powerful, both in terms of calculus and using uh, GPUs. Um, to conclude this um, video, I just want to talk about this difference between um, developers and users and, and then who, who we are. Um, when I'm looking at this picture here, right, I'm feeding all this training data into a machine learning algorithm, and then that's giving us a function we can use to make predictions. Uh, there are classes and I guess people um, in general who uh, either develop new algorithms or, or write code and optimize code for existing algorithms. And we'll just do a tiny bit of that, but that's not our focus. We aren't trying to um, do machine learning research or come up with novel ideas. Um, we aren't developers. Instead, we're going to be users of machine learning algorithms that come in scikit-learn. And, and so some of the questions that we're going to be interested in going forward for the rest of this class is, well, um, which algorithm uh, should we use in sklearn? Um, how should we pick it? And, and I guess how should we configure it, right? A lot of these have different parameters. Um, in terms of the data, how can we clean it up so it's trying to work well with the machine learning algorithm we chose? And then finally, when we actually use this thing, we're going to get all these predictions that we can compare it back to the original. And how do we want to score that? There's not necessarily one right way um, to evaluate how good or bad it is. And so we want to get some experience with that as well. So that's a bit of a preview about um, what's uh, coming up um, in the course. And, and hopefully this is kind of a fun uh, change of, of pace compared to what we've been doing. Hello. In this video, I'm going to be training a regression model from Scikit-Learn um, to some COVID data in Wisconsin. So here I am on the Department of Health Services website, uh, data portal, and I can search for COVID here. And the data set I'm using is this one right here, the historical data by county. Um, so there are about 70 counties in Wisconsin. And what this data shows me is for each day, I wonder if I can go to data browser here. Um, it shows me for each date in each county, um, all of these different stats. Um, so for example, how many positive cases are there total? How many um, new cases are there? How about over the average of the last seven days? And how many deaths are there? And ultimately, what we're going to try to predict in this, um, based on this data is, well, how many deaths are there um, two weeks in the future based on looking at the stats for today? So I had downloaded this, and, and I'm not going to do it again. And then there was a fair bit of data cleanup that I had to do here. And that's not the main point of this lecture. So I have a notebook for it that does all the cleanup. And I'm just going to kind of quickly walk you through this, some of the things I did here without spending too much time on it. Um, one, I pulled out just a few interesting columns. So for example, um, how many positive cases were there on average over the last seven days? And then how many new deaths were there? Um, we had a bunch of missing data, so I just dropped anything with missing data. And, um, and then I converted the date to an actual um, panda state time. And in the process, I, I dropped what hour it was. I just want to get the date without having the hour that it was posted. And, and then finally, um, the documentation for this data set says that um, negative 999 really means that there's less than five um, uh, five and whatever that field is. So it could be anywhere from zero to four. And, and so I think just for simplicity, I just replace that all with zero. We don't really know what that is. Um, you could imagine doing something smarter, like maybe 2.5 seems more fair in some sense. Anyway, so I get a data set that looks like this, right? And in a lot of cases, while well, there's... Um, uh, no new cases and no new deaths, maybe for some of these smaller counties. And then, then of course, for larger county, counties, this definitely is not zero. And um, and so then I go down a little bit more. The other thing I want to do is I want to add a column, which isn't just, well, how many new deaths are there, but how many new deaths are there um, two weeks in the future. 
And so I had to do some trickery with um, time deltas um, to basically join the data in two weeks in the future. And, and you can look at that if you're interested. But, but in the end, I get a data set that looks like this, right? I know um, how many new deaths there are, are on this particular day. And then this last field is how many um, there are after the specific one. And I, and I save all this to this Wisconsin COVID data set. So that's what I'm going to be working with here. And I'm just going to head over here and create a new a notebook um, to analyze that. So let me head here. And then um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to import pandas for starters. So I'm going to say um, import pandas as pd. And maybe while I'm also at it, I'm going to import matplotlib.pyplot as plt and then uh, maybe i'm just trying to configure my matplotlib stuff first uh, lib inline and then uh, plt.rc params um, let's just make the font size a little bit bigger great and so now i can actually get my data frame so i'm going to say data frame equals pd.read csv and what do i want while well, that um, file I produced from that other notebook, which is Wisconsin COVID.csv. And let me just peek at that. So that's all good. And maybe just to make sure that all these things are not actually zero, I'm just going to say, what does the data frame mean? And so I can see on average, um, in, a, in a given county in a given day, um, on average, one in four people um, have died. And and so what I'm going to be trying to do is I'm going to try, try to be predicting this field on, I might either try this. Um, as a feature or this is a feature and this is going to be my label column that i'm actually trying to predict it's a quantity which is why i'm doing a regression instead of a classification um often before i jump into trying to do a regression um, i'll do a scatter plot to just see if i can um, identify visually any patterns in the data and so i might do something like this i might say data frame dot plot dot scatter and then i can say my x equals something and then my y equals something and so in both cases, the thing I'm trying to predict, my Y, is how many deaths are there going to be um, two weeks after this given date. And then my X, I guess, uh, for the first case, I'll try um, the seven-day average, like that. And so I can see a picture there. And then the other thing I want to do is I want to say, well, if I look at how many deaths there were today, what will that tell me about how many deaths there will be two weeks from now? And I see a slightly different pattern there. Sometimes for these, I like to say um, alpha equals 0 0.2 or something like that. Just give it a little bit of transparency when a lot of points are on top of each other. And so I'll do that as well. And, um, and, and so the other thing that I'm going really to like to do as we're going forward is we're going to train a, um, a regression model um, on both of these variables. And so I want you to get a sense when we score that how that score corresponds to um, kind of the strength of the relationship in both of these. So I'll start with this one. How can we train a regression model that fits this to this? And the first thing I have to do is I'm going to have to import it. So I'm going to say from sklearn.linearmodel um, import linear regression. This is the main uh, regression model we're going to learn this semester. So I'm going to do that. And then if I want to, I can create a new linear regression object, just like that. And, and so there's a few, um, there's a few uh, um, methods that we're going to want to learn with this. So some important methods are going to be fit, uh, predict, well fit, score, and predict. And we're going to be running those things on our data, right? So let me come down here. and. Um, and what I can do when I'm fitting it or training it is I give it two pieces of information. I give it my um, uh, my x values and I'll give it my y values. And for the, the y values, um, that could be a series if I want. So um, I could just pull out that one column. For my x values, it has to be a data frame. And, and so let me just take a look at my data frame earlier um what i'm going to do first is do a model corresponding to this plot right so i want to do it based on um, how do the deaths today uh predict the deaths in the future and so what i have to do is i have to plot this one column these um new deaths um into a data frame so the way i'll do that is like this if, if i do this just death new 
then what? Then I just did a series. The way I can do a data frame is I can pass in a list and I can say um, some columns here, right? And so it kind of looks weird, right, that I'm putting a list inside of brackets, but that's what's happening. And, and in this case, I'm really just interested in one thing, which is just, well, how many new deaths were there on this particular day? And so I do that and I get this nice data frame, um, which is going to work well for us. And then for my Y values, I can just um, directly pull it out as a series. And that will be death new uh, two weeks from now, right? So these will be my X values. That must be a data frame. And then this um, Y values and this can be a series, right? And in general, why, why is that? Well, I'm trying to predict one thing but I might be making that prediction based on multiple columns. So I'm going to head down here and I'm just going to copy these things. I'm going to copy this right here. And then I'm going to copy this right here, just like that. And I train it. So fit means to train based on the data. So I've given it a bunch of examples of my features um, and, my, uh, and my labels, right? So I can do that. Um, and that's relatively uneventful. And um, I would like to be able to visualize what it looks like, what this model looks like, kind of what predictions is it making if I have new new data. And it turns out that since I'm uh, doing the, the linear regression on just one column here, it's actually gonna be fairly easy to visualize because I can ask it um, for a given um, X value, well, what y, y value do you predict? So I can do that with this. I can say lr.predict. And then I can have to pass in some sort of value here, right? So I think I can um, pass in um, something like, hey, if there's 10 new deaths today, how many do I predict two weeks from now? And I have to pass this in as a list of lists because that was the shape of this up here. And, um, and I can see that there's also this array thing, which is a NumPy array. We're not going to worry about that too much for now. The way I'll generally do these predictions is that I might create a data frame that will help me show a fit line, right? That's one way we can represent the relationship here, right? If I drew a line on this, um, that would tell me for my X variable, well, what do I predict for my Y? And so I'm gonna create a new fit data frame like this, that data frame, and, um, and then I'm gonna have a, a column, which will be death new. Remember, that's the number of deaths today. And for that, I'm just trying to try to put a bunch of different values, right? Maybe I'll draw from like zero to um, 500. And let me just take a peek at that. Okay, so that's uh, my death new. And then what I can do is I can actually pass that whole thing in to my um, prediction to, uh, to basically um, figure out what those Y values are. So I can say lr.predict. And if I want, I can put in my whole data frame like that and try to find out that column. And again, I get a bunch of these weird values, right, in this NumPy array. Uh, but the great thing is, is that I can say, I want to just shove those things in a new column. And I'm going to call that um, this. I'm going to say um, that. And then I might like to say something like um, predicted, right, to, to emphasize that this is not real data, it's just a prediction. So I'm going to put this up here. And now when I run this, I can see that um, I have, for a given uh, number of deaths on today, well, how many do I predict there will be two weeks from now, right? So if there's 500 deaths today, I guess I'm predicting that in two weeks, there's going to be 160 deaths per, for a particular county. And so what can I do now? I can actually plot this thing. I can say fit df.plot.line, and I can say x equals this thing. And I can say y equals this other thing, just like this. And different models will do, give you different things, but the linear regression right here that I'm using is going to give me a straight line, right? So I'm gonna run that, and there's some sort of straight line there. And maybe I'll just make it um, red, because I'm gonna soon draw some new points. What I often like to do is after I have um, have the, my regression line, I like to compare it to my actual data and so remember I had um, these similar columns before and that was all in my original data frame 
And for my original data frame, I just want to draw a scatter of all those points. And then at this point, I'm not drawing some sort of prediction. I'm actually drawing uh, real data. So I'm going to do that. And um, I guess it's drawing it down here. Let me actually try to put, uh, put that on the same one. So I'm going to say um, AX equals AX. And then I may have the first one return an AX. And then maybe um, down here, I'll have the alpha be 0 0.2 again. And um, why did I put AX there? Um, there we go. And, and so then, then I get these nice um, plots. And I, and I can see that's far too long. Maybe what I should have done is I should have, um, I can see my data only goes to about uh, 100. So maybe here I'll make my predictions over the range of about 100. And so I'm going to do that and I can see how, how that line fits. Okay, well, how well did I do? I mean, I might try to intuit that uh, based by looking at it. And really what I'm looking at is for each of these points, well, I, I'd hope most of them are near the not line and I can see quite a bit of them um, are not. Right? And so the way we um, score these things is we'll look at um, what is the variance in the thing we're trying to predict. Right? So what is the variance in this thing? A variance is kind of um, um, a measure of how much the values typically differ from the average. Right? So I can get my variance, and the variance in this column is 1.35. And the idea is what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, how much do each of these points differ from the average of the points along the y-axis? And then we're going to compare that to like, well, how much um, do they differ from that red line that I drew, right? If, if the line is good, then, um, then that variance relative to the red line might draw down a lot. I'm sorry, the variance um, relative to the red line might draw down a lot relative to um, the average, which I guess I could draw as like a horizontal line. And, and so the way I can do that is I can come back here and just like I um, fit the data, where did I fit the data? I fit it right here. I can check, instead of fitting it, I can score it. Right, and what this is going to tell me is how much of the variance is explained by the model. And that'll typically be a score between um, zero and one, with zero being the worst and then one being the best. And in some kind of weird cases, it can actually go negative, and, uh, and maybe we'll eventually talk about that. But generally, it's going to be between zero and one. And, and so I see this is not great. Okay, let's try to um, do it for our other variable that we had as well, right? So I had this one here, and, and just looking at the plots, I might expect that this one does a little bit better than I think, what was it, like 9%. So I'm going to copy these things down here. And so I'm going to create a new, a new linear regression uh, object. And then what? Then I'm going to um, fit it. Where was I fitting before? Here was how I was fitting before. Um, instead of fitting to the deaths on today, well, let me try to um, fit to how many, um, uh, oh, this, um, I wanted to get the number of positive cases. Where is it? Let me go up and look at my data frame again. I wanted to fit to the um, average number of, of cases over the last seven days. So I'm going to do that now, right? I'm going to train my model, well, this new model, based on this other variable. How, how, does, how can I use this to predict um, how many deaths there will be in, in two weeks? And, um, and maybe right away, I'm just going to score it as well. So maybe I'll just copy this and then score it. And I can see it's doing quite a bit better. Instead of explaining 9% of the variance, I'm explaining 20% um, of the variance. If I was explaining 100% of the variance, well, that would be very remarkable because every point would be exactly on that line. Um, let me try to plot it just like I did before. So I'm going to copy this here. And so I'm going to have to have this. And then remember that um, for this fit data frame, I had to generate that up here using a range of values. All right, so I'm going to paste this here. And, and so what am I going to do again? I'm going to generate um, values from 0 to 100. And that is telling me, well, what was the positive um, uh, seven day uh, average cases? And then I'm going to get a prediction based on that. And then I can plot a line uh, like that. I'm going to do that and I can see, um, well, something a little bit weird, right? I guess. Um, 
I guess I didn't change everything, right? I see the x-axis is still how many deaths there were on the day, as opposed to what I'm actually training on, which was the seven day average, right? So let me fix that and run that again. And so that's a little bit better. I can see that the line doesn't extend very far. That makes sense. Previously, when I was saying, well, how many deaths were there on a given day, the number was relatively small compared to the number of positive COVID cases. And, and so maybe I'll, I'll redo this instead of going from um, zero to 100, maybe I'll go from zero to like 900. And so I run that and, um, and I can see this is a better fit right now. I'm explaining 20% um, of, of the variance instead of, instead of just nine. So I did something bad here. Well, and I want to talk about that in the next video, but I just want to leave you with a thought. Um, let, let's say I'm teaching something in class and I work out an example. And so maybe everybody sees that example and they try to learn from it. Um, if I put exactly that same answer or the, exactly that same example on an exam, um, what does it mean that somebody does well on that exam? Um, I think there's two possibilities. One is that maybe the person genuinely um, learned something from that example. And, and then even though they're seeing the same example again, they understand what's going on. Well, the other possibility is that maybe somebody just memorized the answer to the example. And then when they see it on the exam, well, they just repeat it. And that would be not so great. And so the same thing happens here, right? I'm um, When I'm fitting, I'm really giving my linear, um, linear regression model some examples. And, um, and then when I'm scoring it, well, I'm actually using those same examples. And, and so if this score were good, and I guess here it's not great, but if it were good, then I wouldn't really know. Well, did the model effectively memorize the answers or was it overfitting? Um, overfitting is what we mean when it basically memorizes it. So next time I'm going to talk about how we can actually um, deal with that problem and, and get a better sense of whether, of whether it's doing a good job. So last time I talked about um, this issue of basically evaluating our model on the same data we fit it to, right? The model can effectively memorize the answer and look like it is doing well, even if it didn't really learn anything. And so the way we'll deal with this problem is we'll use something um, in SKLearn called a train test split. And this is a general strategy, but this specific method will make it easy for us. And what we'll do is I'll take our original data frame and give us back two data frames. Uh, we'll train our model to one data frame and then uh, we'll evaluate it on the other one on the data the model has not seen before. And so it's a better test of whether it's doing well. And so I can see that there's a number of things I can pass into this. Um, one is I can say, well, um, what ratio of my data would I like to, I like to go into my test set? Um, I can say other things like um, um, try to stratify the data. Like let's say I was dealing with something categorical. I might want to make sure that I have a similar number of categories on both sides. I'm not trying to do that here, but I will specify a train test set. So let me import this thing. I'm going to say um, from sklearn import, oh, it's sklearn.model selection, import train test split. Okay, and then I'm going to say train test split. And I'm just trying to try to split up my data frame that I have originally. And basically it's returning something called an array with two data frames in it. And so the way I can capture this is I can say, well, I have my train data frame and my test data frame is the order it's going to return them in. And so let me take a look at these. Here's my train data frame. And then here is my test data frame. And, and you can see that it kind of shuffled things around, right? If I look at the index, and I'm dealing with different data, right? So this is the data frame that my model is going to learn from. And then this other one is the one I'm going to use to actually make sure it learns something. And, and so I can see right now, if I look at this, there's 6,300 down here and then 19,000 up here. And that's because the default split is 0 0.25. So I could do something like this if I want. And then that would make this first one bigger and the next one smaller. So um, I'm going to do that. Oh. And then uh, let me just see what I, I did wrong here. I think I actually have to say test size. So I'm going to say test size equals that. And then this is going to be a little bit bigger, more data to test on, and then a little bit less data to train on. And, and so there's some trade-offs there. Anyway, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to head back to this example that I had earlier where I was doing my training. 
And the idea is instead of fitting and scoring on the same data, I'm going to fit to my training data and then uh, score on my test data. So I'm just going to do it again from scratch for review. And I'm going to say LR equals linear regression. And, oh, there we go. And then I'm going to say LR.fit. And I have my uh, train data frame. And then I have a list of columns here. And then here I may have my Y column. All right, so that's the general strategy. And then what I want to do is I want to score it. All right, and when I'm scoring it, I'm going to give it a Y column and an, um, uh, and an X column again. I'm sorry, I have to say train DF here. I'm going to give it that same information, uh, but now I'm going to be uh, doing the test data frame. All right, so I'm going to say test data frame and then same thing down here, test data frame. Right, and then what I'm going to do is um, for this, I'm going to pass in a list of columns like before. And what was I doing last time? I was um, looking at this positive uh, seven day average. And so I'm going to pass that in just like that. And the same thing here. And then over here, I can just look at that thing that I'm trying to predict my Y, which was this thing. I'm going to pass that in. And then the same here. I'm going to do that. And I see that, okay, my score is 0.16. Whereas, what would happen if I wanted to um, run it on my original training data frame? Like that, training data frame. And here it does better on the data I trained it on. So this suggests that there is some overfitting here, right? The model does better on the data it learned from instead of some new data um, it hasn't seen before. And so that, of course, is a, is a concern. And, um, and so there's different things I can try to do to um, avoid that, and we'll eventually talk about some of those things this semester. Hello. Uh, today I'm going to be talking more about how we can uh, determine whether or not a model um, is doing a good job or, or not. Um, how can we interpret different scores and make sure that we aren't getting a good score just by chance. And so I'm going to be picking up last time um, with the model that's trying to predict um, COVID deaths two weeks out based on the current number of cases. And, um, and so let me just quickly review what I did last time. Um, we were doing a train test split on our data frame, and our data frame looked like this right here. And um, it was per county, and then there's every day in the year there. Um, then I created this linear regression model, which I imported from sklearn.linear linear, linear model. And then I did two things with it. I, I fit it to my training data, and then I scored it on my, um, on my testing data. And these were the two pieces, my training data and testing data came from here. And so when I was doing this, um, what I basically did is I put in my Y values, which is what I'm ultimately trying to predict. And then here I put in my X values or my features, um, which are things I know right now. So for example, right now I know the seven day rolling average um, of positive test cases, and then two weeks out, I'm trying to predict, well, how many deaths will there be? Um, this can be a sing single series, which is why we just put a string um, in the brackets after the data frame. Um, here, we actually have to pass in a full data frame because, in general, we might have multiple features. And when I pass in a list um, to the brackets after a data frame, well, I get a smaller data frame. And that's why I have the double brackets there. So anyway, so I have this 0.2. And, um, and we know that the score will somewhere be, be somewhere between 0 and 1. So it's a little bit hard to say how good this score is, right? Maybe um, you always get something like 0 0.2 by chance. Do we know? Um, so that's one of the things I want to talk about today. And then the other thing that you might notice is if I rerun this a few times, oh, now I'm at 27%, 30, 32%, 24%, 24, 28, 26. So you can see that Based on how I do this train test split, um, I can do very different numbers. And, and so that doesn't give us a lot of assurance. So how can we get some more stable numbers um, out of the system? Um, I'll just give you a, a kind of a, a hint of what the problem is. If I look at train DF and I look at this um, column here, which is the thing we're trying to predict, um, let me do that. So I have all those numbers there. Let me look at the variance of that column. Variance is just kind of a measure of um, how different values are from the average. And then I'm also going to do that thing, same thing for the test. And so when I do that for the test, I see that actually they have quite different um, variances. And if I run this again, 
well, it's going to randomly shake out differently. Now the test data actually has a higher variance than, than the training data. And um, we're going to eventually look at how this scoring function works, but it turns out that it's very much based on this variance, uh, which is why we have such a noisy measure. So let me head over to the slides and try to give a preview of the things we're going to talk about today. Um, we're going to be learning four new, um, new functions related to model evaluation. So first, we're going to learn these two functions here, which will let us score our models. Um, second, if our model is kind of med mediocre like mine is, right? I mean, 0 0.2 is not great. How can we know if it's not just um, chance? And then we're going to be using something called the permutation uh, test score for that. And then finally, um, to get a less noisy measure, we're going to be doing something called cross value um, um, uh, scoring. And so uh, let me start here with these two metrics here. I have this R2 score and mean absolute error, and we'll talk about how those work. So um, if I go back to my slides, or go back to my notebook right here, I'm doing this scoring here. Um, I can also up here, I can say um, from sklearn.metrics import, um, there's a couple things I wanna do. I wanna do the R2 score, and then the mean um, absolute error score. And so the way all of these metrics work is kind of like this. I'll, I'll call the metrics function, and then I'll say something like, um, let me actually just check this here quick. I'll say something like, um, I had to make sure the order um, is different between my true and my predicted. I'll say, um, you know, what are the true values, and then my predicted um, values. And, and so for example up here, I know that these are my true values, and then my predicted values, well, how do I figure out my predicted values? I can just say, well, model, please predict for me what these y values should be based on these x values that I'm going to give you. All right, so I'm going to do that. And so here I'm, I'm putting in x values, and it's going to return back to me y values um, in this weird array thing that we'll eventually talk about. But I could take this and I could put this right here. And, um, and so then I could use lots of different metric functions here. Um, I could, for example, um, use the um, R2 score right here. And guess what? It turns out that this score here that's associated with the model is just defaulting to use our R2 score. There's lots of different uh, metrics I could have used instead, but this one is the default one. So let's talk a little bit about um, um, let's talk a little bit about um, how this score is computed. So the idea of it is that this is the thing I'm trying to predict, right? So this is my Y column, and so I'm going to say y is here, and um, I can just peek at that. Um, what I want to do is I want to look at um, basically the squared re residuals of this column relative to the mean. And, and so what does that mean? So I can take this and I can subtract off the mean of this, and then if I want to I can um, square all of that. So this is really a measure of kind of how bad the system is if I add all of these things up. So this is um, this is really well the, the like the variance of the system um, except that I'm summing instead of averaging, right? So this was my original um, kind of total um, error or variance in the system I might think of it as, except I'm just adding up, so it's kind of a sum of squares. And then what I want to think about is <coughs> what if instead of um, measuring the distance from each um, each uh, value to the mean, what if I measure the distance to my um, actual prediction, right? So it'll be very similar here, right? I can say, um, you know, what um, what is kind of left over if I subtract off my predictions? How do I get my predictions? Well, that's this right here. So I'm going to grab this piece, and I'm going to have my predictions here, and then let me take a look at that. So the way I really think about it is that originally this was how much variance I had in the system, and this is how much I have um, after I after I do predictions rather than just subtracting off the mean. And and so what I could do is well I could say um, I could say well how much is remaining, right? So I could say left over divided by the total, and um, why is that? Oh, let me just put that here. I can say that left over divided by the total. And I'm like, okay, well, I left 79% um, uh, of the variance on the table, basically, which means that I took away 20%. And um, 
<coughs> and you can see that that's exactly what this is up here, right? So really, this is the, the math that people will really kind of use to evaluate how good a regression is. Typically, um, we can do that more simply with the R2 score, and even more simply, um, that's the default if I just say uh, linear regression dot score. Let me give you an example of another metric people might use. Um, so maybe I want to just get, well, what is the average error? And so in that case, I would go back to this piece, right? So this is all of the errors. And if I want to get the average, I should probably just think about the absolute error. And then I could take the mean of that, right? So this would be the average um, absolute error. And, um, and it turns out that that is just, um, rather than me calculating that myself, I could just grab this mean absolute error here. There's lots of different metrics in here, and I think if I hit shift tab, uh, oh, maybe it's just regular tab, I can see all the different metrics that, that come here. And most of them I have never used. So I'm going to paste this here, and I see, well, that's kind of strange. Um, it should be the same, it should be the same number. Um, why is that not the same number? Because um, I wanted to get the error of my predictions, not relative to the mean. And so, I'm sorry, this was the thing that I wanted to, uh, this is the thing I had wanted to grab. Right, so I wanted to say, you know, here are all my errors. Take the absolute value of them, right? Some errors are positive or negative. I just want to have the absolute value. Then I have the average. And why is that? Um, Invalid syntax. That usually probably means I have a, a mismatch in terms of my parentheses. I see. So this one has um, is matched up there. So I don't know why I grabbed that squared. Okay, so I can see that this is all my errors, and then I'm taking the absolute, and then I'm taking the average. And now, thankfully, okay, well, I actually get the same thing that I have down here. And so again, right? This is just a shortcut for um, this kind of more complicated math, but it's another um, metric in terms of how these metrics work. Um, uh, this one is kind of um, counting all errors more equally. Um, you know, an uh, error that's twice as big is just twice as bad. Because this one up here, where I'm doing the, um, when I'm doing, where is it? Right here, when I'm doing the R, R squared score, because that one is squaring my errors, um, this will tend to um, make it look worse if I have um, a few errors that are really big as opposed to many small errors. Okay, so those were a couple metrics, um, which was one of the things we wanted to answer in the slide. So I'm just going to head back here. We talked about our, our squared score. We talked about mean absolute squared or error. And um, that's our different ways we can measure our errors. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is if our score is kind of mediocre, like 0 0.2 um, out of um, 1, how do I know that that's actually good and it's not just chance? And the answer is that what we'll do is we'll take our original data here, and we'll score it with our model, right? We'll train a model of the x's and the y's and just score it. And so let's say my score is 0 0.8, which is not that good. What I'll do is I'll um, shuffle around the data so I know that there's no relationship between the y's and the x's, right? So what I'll do is I'll take this y column and just randomly shuffle it. And the word for that is uh, permutate it. And so I get this um, permutated version of this column, right? You can see that. Um, for example, five used to be the first number, and, and now, now five is down here, right? So I just kind of randomly shuffle that thing, and then I train the model on it, um, trying to look for the relationship between the y's and the x's, and there should be no relationship, obviously, right? Because I just shuffled everything around, but I can try to train a model and get a score on it. And so if I see that when I'm basically um, training a model on garbage data, if I get a better score than um, than I did originally, well, that probably means that I didn't have any sort of significant result um, originally, right? So I probably didn't have any sort of meaningful model. And, um, and so that's the rough idea. Uh, in actual implementation, uh, what this function here is going to do for us is it's going to shuffle around the data like this, and it's going to get a score, and then it's going to shuffle it again, and it's going to get a score, and it's going to get something like, you know, 100 or 1,000 different scores based on these shuffled data. And then based on that, we can estimate and really see this score over here. Is it is it kind of unusually good, or does it feel like this could fit in um, with uh, the garbage data? And based on that, we can 
um, we can basically say, well, hey, do I trust this model or not? So I'm going to head over here, uh, back to the notebook. And um, and so maybe, maybe I'm just going to make some notes in here just so it's clear what we're doing. So this part was about metrics. And then this part is going to be about permutation testing. And so let me, I actually already imported it which is great. So all these things are kind of related to um, model evaluation and they're under this thing called model selection because what we'll often do is have a few different models and we're trying to have different tools to say, well, what is the model that we think is best that we're gonna recommend to people? So I see that I have this permutation test score <clears throat> and I'm gonna paste this right here and I can see that I need three things. At a minimum, I have to have my um, model, which is just LR, <clears throat> I have to have my um, uh, my x values and then finally my y values. And, and so the way I'm going to be doing this here is since um, um, since here I have this uh, test df and uh, and um, for both my x and my y, I'm just going to grab these, right? So this was my x right here based on the seven day average. I want to predict this right here. And so I'm going to grab this. And um, it turns out that this is going to return a tuple of length three. So I'm just going to run that. That'll take a moment. And the three things in that tuple um, are going to be the score of my module model originally. It will be um, you know some other scores when I have um, maybe I'll just call the the garbage score since I'm permuting the data. I'm not expecting to have any um, pattern. There's going to be a bunch of those. And, um, and then there's going to be something called a p-value. And what the p-value is telling me is, well, what is the probability um, that, um, that a score this good would be generated by a system that's generating all these garbage scores, right? And so if this is really small, then I can see, well, this is actually much better than my garbage scores. And so I actually have a significant result. So since these are the three things that it's returning, right, I know that T is a tuple, I can just put that here and it'll automatically unpack those things for me. So I'll, I'll take a look at this and then I get um, a score for my model and then I can have my garbage scores here. I see there's a whole bunch of them. If I want to, I can put those in a series and, uh, and then I can get a histogram of those. And I can see that, you know, they're actually around zero or less, right, all of these. Um, and this was around 0 0.09, which is actually um, uh, pretty far over here. So it seems like we're pretty far away from these garbage scores. And therefore, this p-value is going to be pretty small. It seems like whatever process uh, I'm using to get all these garbage scores is not likely to have a score this good. So I will take this as a meaningful um, result. Uh, let me head back here for another idea. So how do we deal with the noise? We saw that when I kept doing it a bunch of times, I was getting different scores. And um, for that, we're going to use something called a cross-validation uh, cross validation score. And, and the way it'll work is I'm going to split my data. Instead of just having these train and test, I'm going to split it into four pieces. And then each of those four pieces are going to take turns being the test data. So maybe first I'll train my data on these rows, and then I'll test it on this. And then my model will get, let's say, a score of 0 0.2. And uh, then I'll take a different chunk of the data. And each of these are called a fold of the data, by the way. And so I'll train on those first, second, and fourth pieces. So I get a model. And then I evaluate on that test data set. And let's say this time I get a little bit luckier, and it's 0 0.3. Do it again, 0 0.1, again, 0 0.2. And then I could take the average of these. And that would be a more stable measurement of um, kind of how well my model does. It's not as um, it's not kind of as vulnerable um, to uh, what happens to go in the test or training data set because all the data at some point is in the test data um, or the training data. So I'm going to head over here and, um, and do this, right? So this is called uh, cross-validation. And let me call this thing. So cross-validation score. And what do I have to pass in here? I have to pass in my estimator. And then I have to pass in my x values and then my y values, right? So let me let me grab those things, right? So it's actually, I guess, identical to this right here. 
So I'm going to grab my model, my x values, and my y values. And, um, and this time I just want to do it on all my data. So I'm going to say data frame and then data frame. And actually really what is kind of the best practice is just to do that in the training data. And, um, and so I'm going to do that. And then I get all of these um, scores back, right? And the reason is that there were five folds by default. So I could say, um, you know, in this picture right there is four. Here I see, well, by default there were five. That's why I got five scores. I can say I want 10 of them. And that'd be fine. I get all these 10 scores back. And, and these kind of look like those numbers we were seeing earlier, like 0 0.27, 0 0.17, another 0 0.27, and 0 0.304. Right, if I head back here, and I just kind of run this thing a few times, those are the kinds of numbers I'm getting out of it as I randomly split my, um, my train and my test. So why is this useful? Well, I can have my scores here, and I can say a couple things. I can say scores.mean, and so I can see, well, on average, um, my uh, R2 score, R squared score is going to be 0 0.21, but I could also get some sense of the variance, and that'll tell me how sensitive I am um, to what data happens to end up in the, the test or training data set. And that probably depends, you know, how much I, uh, on how much um, I have some outliers and how much outliers define um, what happens with the, with the scoring. Okay, so this will be the way we'll generally do it. And, and so one last thing, right? When I was um, showing this picture here, right? I kind of said, well, hey, I have all my data and then I just, you know, split it up into train and test. Why didn't I use all my data here? And the reason is that, um, is that even though that would have been fine to do in this example, what you're often going to be doing is you're going to be trying to do a few different models. And what you'll want to do is you'll want to do cross-validation on each of the models, and then you'll see, well, what do you, one has the best score on average? And you say, well, that one's the winner. That's the one we're going to use in the future. And, um, and so there's this risk when you're doing that. Let's say I evaluate 20 models and pick the best one. The, the best one probably did a little bit better than it should, right? If I do 20 models, some will just by luck do better and some will do worse. And so um, even though that's the right process to pick the best model, um, I shouldn't go brag about this cross-validation score because it wasn't like I was just doing one model as in here. I was doing many models. So what I would do is I'd look at this cross-validation score um, across each of my models, pick the best one, and then finally would I go back and actually do my real test data um, which is still hanging out here. And then that's what I would report as the um, kind of accuracy of my favorite chosen model. Hello, in this video, we're gonna be learning about um, uh, scikit-learn pipelines. Um, we've been learning um, how to use linear regression as a model. And um, often our model will have to transform the data in some sort of way um, before we can actually analyze it. And so what we'll end up with for our models are these pipelines where we do a series of transformations and then at the end um, we'll use an estimator is what they call it in, in scikit-learn to actually make predictions. And, um, and so for this example, I may be using a slightly more complicated data set. Um, in, in Chicago, right, which is right on Lake Michigan, they have all these sensors on different beaches which are measuring things about the waves. And so we're going to be um, looking at this data set all these measurements. So I can see, well, here's an Ohio beach, here's um, 63rd Street beach. And then I know all, all these things about these sensors, like how warm is the water, um, turbidity, and other things like that. And the why that we're going to try to predict is, well, how big are the waves on this beach? And, um, and we're going to be using things like, um, um, like wave period to predict it, or maybe by looking directly at what beach we're on. And, um, and so there's some garbage data in here, so I've cleaned that off. So this is a, a picture of all the data where I have the wave period um, on the on the x-axis, and then on the y-axis I have wave height. Um, then I also try to break it down and to look beach by beach. So here I'm um, kind of pulling out all the beaches um, as a, a sorted list that's unique from the beach name. Um, and then what am I doing down here? I'm, I'm drawing each beach separately. So I'm, I'm creating some subplots. And uh, I'm looping over those, and I'm, I'm basically plotting each beach, right? I'm doing some filtering in, in Pandas, so I'm plotting each beach in a different um, AX region. And so I look at this. And, and so there's a couple observations right away. Often before I do modeling, I like to just do a lot of scatter plots and, and try to get an intuition for what's going on. One is that I do see that what beach we're on is an important variable. Um, some of these beaches have different patterns in terms of the waves. 
the other thing I see is that um, that the relationship between wave period and wave height um, is not linear. Um, it's not as if the bigger the wave period, the bigger the wave height, or vice versa. What I see is often there's kind of like this hump in the middle, right? So kind of if we want to get the biggest waves, we need a wave period that's somewhere in the middle. So I'm going to be making four different models here um, that try to analyze this data. Um, and they're each going to be using different variables in different ways. Um, first will be something very similar to what we've done before. I'll try to predict the wave height based on wave period just using a simple linear regression. And we'll see what performance we have there. Um, next, we're going to learn how we can do um, a, a polynomial FET, right? So that means if I'm drawing a line on here, well, the line doesn't have to be straight anymore. Um, finally, I'm going to look at, uh, well, not finally, but next I'm going to look at what beach. If, I, if the only thing I know is what beach I'm on, how well can I predict? And then finally, I'm going to look at the combination of both beach and wave period, uh, with wave period being treated as a polynomial, then see how much I can predict there. So in terms of my imports, I have some things that we've done before. Uh, we've um, The first thing we learned was how to do a linear regression. We would um, fit our linear regression to a training data set, and then we would evaluate it on a test data, data set um, at the very end. Um, along the way, we might also do cross-validation within just the training data set. So these things are, are old, and then these things down here are new, right? So um, in order to be able to... Um, deal with this data uh, and I want in a polynomial way, I might have to transform it using this polynomial features thing. Um, if I want to deal with categorical data, like, well, what beach am I on? That's not a number, right? That's a category. I have to use this thing called one hot encoder. And, um, and if I want to use both of those, I have to use this other thing, make column transformer to combine them. And in total, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have this pipeline. And in the end of the pipeline, I'm still going to be doing just a simple linear regression but I'm going to be making all these transformations to the data before it gets to that. And, uh, and that's how I'm going to be able to do these more complicated models. So let's start down here. And um, I'm going to call, I'm just going to number these four models, um, one, two, three, four, just following the numbering up here. And so I'm going to have model one is going to be just a simple linear regression like that. And, um, and then what I could do is I could say um, M1, well, actually, I could do different things. I could say uh, m1.fit, and I would fit that to my x values, and then my y values here. This is uppercase because it's a full data frame, and then this is lowercase because it's just um, a single series. And um, and I guess before I have to do that, I actually have to separate out my train uh, data frame from my test data frame. I'm going to say train test split df, and maybe I'll just look at the length of both of these. And so about 25% is going into testing, which I'll, I'll be fine with that. And so then down here, I have to have my train DF. And then here I can put a list of features. And then over here, I'm going to have my train DF again. And then I'm just going to have my Y column. And so my Y column, the thing I'm trying to predict is just, well, the wave height. Like that. And then my list of features. Um, well, first off, I've put a list here. And that's why I get these weird double brackets. Um, I'm just going to start with wave period, just like that. And um, I probably have to capitalize to match what is in my um, data frame from earlier if I, if I check back. Um, yep, it looks like all these things are capitalizing. And so I can do that. And, um, and now uh, this model has learned the pattern. And so then what I could do is I could say m1.predict uh, based on my testing data. So I could say test df, right? So I give it um, only x values, and then it's going to predict what these y values are for me. And so let me, um, oh, why did I call it m2, m1? And so I get all these predictions. And then what I could do is I could compare those predictions to what I actually have for that wave period, right? I can compare these numbers to these numbers down here. And at a glance, I see it's not very close. Um, the easier way for me to do that comparison and actually get a score will be, I call the scoring, right? So the score function will automatically call that predict on this, and then it'll compare that to um, my test DF of wave height, and it will tell me what percentage of the variance I'm explaining there. And I see right now it's terrible, right? I'm not really explaining uh, anything. If I just um, always predicted the average wave height, 
that would be better than what I'm, I'm doing right now. Now, of course, some of this is luck in terms of like how I um, did my train test split. And so the more reliable way to get a measure here, let me just print that, would be to do my cross validation. Right, so I can say cross validation score. And then here I have to give it three things. I have to say, well, what is my model? My model is M1. Um, what are my um, X values and what are my Y values? I'm going to do this up here. And, um, and when I'm doing the cross validation, I, I usually do that all within the training data. And I just try to hold back the test data for the very end of my project um, to have a final analysis. So now I see I actually get a variety of scores. And we can see that, yeah, it is a matter of luck. Sometimes I, I do worse than zero. Most of the time, not. Um, I can say how many pieces I want to break my data into. Remember that I cycle through each piece or fold, and it has its turn being the, the test data set. So I can get more number here, numbers here. Maybe I'm just going to say scores equals that. And I could say scores.mean. And so this is probably a better indication of how well my model is doing. I'm explaining um, one tenth of one percent of the pattern, which is not too surprising, right? All I'm using is the wave period, and I'm trying to fit a straight line to this. And I can see, well, yeah, no surprise, I can't fit a straight line to it. Okay, um, if I wanted to, um, let me just copy this for a moment. I'm going to delete it shortly. If I wanted to do more columns, um, that would be an easy thing to do. So, for example, if I wanted to also include uh, let's say like the water temperature, I could easily add that as another column, right? Um, it's very simple to have multiple X values, right? So I can do that here and, uh, and then down here as well. And, and then maybe I get a slightly different score, still not great, right? You know, just trying to delete this here, right? But it's very easy to add these different things. And, and why is that? Well, when I, when I do this and I put that list here, I'm just getting a simple data frame of, um, of X columns that I want to use for my predictions. Okay, so that's um, that's how we can add things. Let's actually think about how we're going to do this now. I want to have a polynomial um, FET. So what we'll do is, let me actually delete all of this. Um, I'm just going to create a demo here, which is going to be a trap copy of my train DF. And uh, in my train DF, I'm going to have uh, just a um, uh, wave period. Let me take a look at this data frame. Uh, what we're going to be doing, if I want to have, um, uh, say, like a quadratic fit, I want to um, just add some columns down here that are going to contain that squared data. And so I could do things like this. I could say demo, um, uh, oh, I could say uh, period squared um, equals demo of wave period. That, or I could have like one that's cubed like this, and um, um, and why is that unhappy? Um, oh, because I'm doing like a, a comparison, not an assignment, so I just assume that's already exists. And so if I do that, then um, and you know what I want to do I actually want to copy this so that it doesn't complain. Um, I can see what I'll do is that this column well. 2 squared is 2, 2 cubed is 8, 3 squared is 9, 3, uh, three uh, cubed is, is 27. And so what I can actually do is I can do a linear regression across these things, right? And so even though it's technically a linear regression, it's going to act like a, um, a quadratic or cubic regression because, um, because I'm just treating these as regular columns, right? And I can put um, kind of weights to how important these things are. And so how can I do this? So here I was just manually adding these things. Um, if I want to, I can use this polynomial features thing. And so down here I'm going to say poly um, equals polynomial features. And I can say poly.fit transform. And what I want to do, I want to um, transform my data right here. Um, this was what I had before. So I'm going to run this thing. And I see that I get all these different columns. And, um, and if I wanted to, let me capture those in, in data, right? This is one of those NumPy arrays, which we'll eventually learn about. Um, until we learn about it, I just want to put it in a, in a pandas data frame so I can better see what's happening. So I'm going to say pandas.data frame. And then I'm going to put my data there. And then I want to figure out what the column names are on those. And it turns out that this thing will tell me that as well. So I can say, um, uh, I'm sorry, poly will tell me that. Uh, so I can say poly.lit 
feature names, just like that. And I actually have to say columns equals that. And, um, and now I can see, well, I have um, x and then x squared. And I actually have to tell what my original name was for that to work. Um, I actually have to have like a list of that. Excuse me. And, and so I can see, okay, well, I have period and I have period squared. And if I wanted to up here, I could say um, things like, well, I want to have it be a fourth degree, right? So I could have period, period squared, period cubed, period to the fourth. You can see it also is giving me period to the zero, which is just a column of ones, right? And so what I'll often do is I'll disable that. It's called the bias column. So I'll say, I don't want that thing. And, and, and so now I actually have something that's very similar to what I did above manually. And I could do that um, with my data, right? I could, um, if I wanted to, I could do this transformation on both my training data and then my test data. And then that's what I would do all my modeling on. Now, I think to keep things simpler, what we'll want to do is we'll want to automatically um, transform and then immediately apply um, the linear regression. And so it turns out that um, pipelines, which I also imported up here, uh, make that really easy to do, right? So I can create a pipeline down here like this. And maybe I'll just draw this. Um, this is going to be my second model. It's going to be a pipeline. And then we have to pass in a list here. Um, and the way the list works is that I will have like transformers. Um, uh, and I might have like one or more of those. And then at the end, I'm going to have an estimator. Right, so all of these things are going to be um, modifying my data in some way, maybe adding more columns. And then at the very end, I'm going to actually do my um, real model. And my real model is just a linear uh, regression like that. And then here, well, what are my transformers? Well, I'm just going to do polynomial features like this. And um, and I think degree of two will be fine for us for now. And so I have these two things. And um, then the other detail about this pipeline is that we have to name um, each of our stages of the pipeline. And the way that it wants us to do that is it wants us to put these things in, in parentheses to create a tuple and then put a name as the first part of the tuple. So I'm going to call this... Um, transformer poly because it's a polynomial um, uh, transformer. And then this thing, um, I don't know, I'll just call that LR for short, right? It doesn't really matter. All right, so let me just take a look here. Um, M2, it kind of shows me all these details of it. But now M2 is just a, a, a model, right? And it's a lot like a simple linear regression. Um, I can do it in all the same ways. So for example, if I head back here, um, all of this stuff I did before, you know, I just created M1 as my um, as my model, and I did all this stuff on it. I can do all those same things down here, right? So if I if I run down here and I just say M2 dot fit, um, and maybe I'll just delete this for simplicity. Um, everything is the same, and, and I can see well, maybe I'm doing slightly better now, right? So what was my score before? Actually, that's exactly the same. I was expecting to do slightly better, and why wasn't I doing better? Probably because I was evaluating my same model, that's the curse of the of the copy paste. Okay, so so before let me just see this. I was explaining a 0.1%, uh, well, I guess closer to 0.2% of the variance, and now I'm explaining more like 4.6%. Uh, so I can see that model two is a huge improvement on model one. And the only thing I really did there, I'm still doing a linear regression, but I'm just giving it a little bit more information to work with by um, giving it these extra columns. I have a column that says something like, wave period squared. And going way back here, the intuition is right, is I'm fitting a line here, and that line doesn't have to be straight anymore. It can be a quadratic line that kind of curves. Okay, so we have two of these models. We have this one, which was terrible, right? It told me almost nothing. Sometimes this one, um, depending on your trained test data set, would actually um, lead you farther away from the truth than if you just always guess the average. Um, this one is actually doing somewhat well, right? It's explaining almost 5% of the variance. Um, let's try uh, the beach and uh, and see how we can uh, do that. So that'll be my third model. And so if I come down here, um, I think for this one, I'm just going to go back to here and, and try this as a first attempt. Maybe I should have some comments here, right? So this is, uh, this is um, uh, poly on period. And then what was this one up here? So model one, this was just linear on period. 
and then I'm going to try doing um, uh, you know linear on beach is what I'm trying try to do right now. And so if I have this model, I'm going to call this model three, and I'm going to delete this again just to keep it clean. I'm going to do this down here. Um, the main thing I want to do is instead of having it be wave period, I want it to be the beach name. And if I had it all the way up here, I just see well that's beach name. Okay, so I'm going to head down here and I want to predict the wave height based on beach name, all right? So just like that. And then this is also beach name down here. And this is trying to um, complain to me. And what does it complain about? It says, could not convert to a float. Ohio street name, street beach is not, um, it cannot be converted to a float. And that makes a lot of sense, right? So this thing here, um, if I take a look at it, is that's categorical data. And it turns out the linear regression, we'll eventually learn why, but it wants everything to be um, numeric. And, and so that's a problem. And so how do I, how do I, um, how do I deal with this? I mean, maybe one idea that students sometimes come up with is that I could encode these. I could say like one means Ohio Beach, uh, and then maybe two means a Calumet uh, Beach, and then maybe three means something like uh, Montrose Beach. And the problem is, is that if I put these numbers like this, um, the linear regression model is going to assume they're meaningful. And so what that means is that if the model learns something about Ohio Beach and then it learns something about Montrose Beach, it mistakenly thinks it knows something about Calumet Beach. It's going to think that that's somehow the average of these other children. Of course, that's not true, right? I mean, just I kind of arbitrarily put these numbers here. There's no reason to believe that this beach has characteristics that are kind of average of other two. So that's not trying to work, right? I can't encode it that way. The idea that we're going to use instead is called one hot encoding. And one hot encoding looks like this uh, one hot encoder. It's going to be like that. And I can say one hot encoder.fit transform. I'm going to fit transform um, this data right here. And I get this weird thing that's, well, whatever is that? That's like a, it says it's like a sparse matrix. Um, we're going to eventually learn more about that, but I can convert it to this thing, which is um, is uh, is a NumPy array. And then that thing I can actually put into, maybe I'm going to simplify this a bit. That thing I can actually put into a data frame. Right? So I'm going to say pandas.data frame, just like this. And then just like before, I want to figure out what these columns are. And, and so just like with the polynomial transformer, I could say get feature names, uh, same deal here, right? I can say a uh, one hot dot get feature names uh, like that. And then I have to tell it, well, what was I originally operating with? And I guess that was like the beach. And why is that unhappy? So the shape of the values passed is this, and, and the indices imply something like that. I wonder what is going on wrong there. I think my problem is that I, I need to say like columns equals that. Um, okay, and so how is this working? So the first one, my first row was Ohio Beach. And you see that I have actually a column for each different beach. And what we'll do is we'll set within that, we'll set it to one if it's an Ohio Beach, and then it'll be zero in all the others. Um, if I go a few down, I see that I have a Montrose Beach in position four, right? And so that case, I'll, I'll put a one under Montrose Beach and then a zero is under others. And that's why we call it one hot, right? So I guess the place where it's hot is where we have a one and then um, everywhere else it's a zero, right? So if I have this, even though I started with some um, um, categorical data, I can end up with something where, um, um, where I have a bunch of numbers. And so if I, if I clean this up here, let me go back to this. I may actually delete all of this because this was kind of a dead end, right? Um, what will be a closer inspiration is the pipeline I used before with um, um, with the with the polynomial features because just like polynomial features is a transformer, um, so also is one hot encoding, right? So I'm going to tweak this. We're on model three now, and this is one hot. And here I can just blow all this away and I can say one hot encoder, just like that. And then I can do my linear regression down here. And so then I can say, um, down here I can say, uh, I think it was like beach name, right? So beach name and then 
Uh, actually, I don't even need this, right? I'm, I'm kind of, this will automatically do the fitting for me and tell me how well it's doing. Um, I wonder why this is complaining up here. I get nervous that that's red. Anyway, it'll probably tell me shortly. Um, I can say beach name here. And then let me try that. And then sure enough, it's invalid syntax um, because I didn't have a match there. And so this does even better than before, right? So I guess just looking at the beach name is even better than knowing what the wave period is, right? So my model is getting better and better, right? First, I started with just a linear model on uh, uh, on the wave period, and then that's terrible, right? I'm not even explaining 1%. Then I said, well, let's do a polynomial fit on uh, on the wave period, and I'm explaining almost um, almost 5%, and, uh, four and a, well, about 4.5%. Then I just look at only at the beach and I get 5.5%. And so the um, kind of natural next thing to do is, well, um, let's do the regress regression on both beach and, um, and also a polynomial of the um, wave period. And maybe I can do even better, right? Maybe the, both of these things are providing me some information. And, and so here's where I get um, to have a challenge, right? Because I want to do one hot encoding on the beach name, and I want to do polynomial features on my other column, right? So I have to have some sort of way of combining these things. And it turns out that that's that last piece that I imported up here. The make column transformer is going to let me stitch together multiple transformers, each of which applies um, to a different column. So I'm going to come down here and... Um, and I'm going to copy this for my inspiration for um, for kind of model four. All right, so I'm going to have model four now. And what am I going to do? So this is what has to change, right? Somehow I have to have something here that can capture both columns, right? Because what I'm going to do down here is I'm going to pass in both beach name and wave period like that in an effort to, um, to predict my wave height. And so how do I do that? Well, I'm going to call that thing that I imported, which was uh, make column transformer. And when uh, I'm calling that thing, and when I'm calling that, uh, what I'll do is I'll have just a series of transformers. And so I'll have like transformer one and then transformer two. And if I wanted to, I could have more, but I don't need that in this case. Um, each of these things, each of these transformers is going to be a tuple, and the tuple will be the transformer, and then it will be um, a list of the columns that it applies to, right? So, so both are going to be like this, right? I have these um, tuples, and maybe I'll just uh, put a new line there. So I'm going to have these two transformers, and then a list of columns. And so I think what I want to do is I want to do um, one hot encoding on the beach name, right? So I'm going to copy my one hot encoder right here and then what column does that apply to well that applies to the beach name column and then my other one was polynomial features which i should just copy from up above that was this thing right here polynomial features is my other encoder and what does that apply to that only applies to wave period okay so i have this um this model for now and uh and then i can well try running it and now i see i'm getting up to 9.5 percent of variance explained, which is actually, well, I guess I was wishing, I wish I was explaining 100%, but I can see by uh, kind of considering both these factors, I'm explaining quite a bit more um, than I would have otherwise. Um, so one last thing I want to do before I wrap up this video is I want to talk about why we have these names here. And um, I can use this, um, we can uh, use pipelines uh, like a dictionary, right? So, um, so for example, that means I can put both here, and what will that give me? That will give me this column transformer that I created right here. And so if I wanted to, I could um, kind of peek at what this thing is doing as a way to debug my model. I could say fit transform, and then what I could do here is I could say, well, this is the data I'm working with. So I could see that, um, well, and then I guess I'd actually uh, need to have some column names here as well. But I could see, well, this is what um, what I'm dealing with. So let me do a data frame here. I, I could see that it has all these columns here that have the one hot encoding. 
And then I have these columns here that are doing um, polynomial features on other things. So this is the data that I'm using to try to predict what the wave height is. So even though I'm kind of starting with just these two columns, after I do all this transformation, I'm, I'm actually giving um, I'm giving the, the linear regression here at the end of my pipeline quite a bit more information to work with, and that's why we're able to do much better uh, better here. So as the very last step, um, what I would like to do, so I saw that um, model four was clearly the best one, right? So that's the one I'll recommend. Now, it's possible if I'm doing four different models, one of them just kind of by luck does better, and that's why I, I hung on to my... Um, uh, to my training data, right? I only used, uh, or on my test data, I only used training data for cross validation scoring. So at the very, very end, I'm going to fit this data to these things, just like that. And then let me just run that. And then I could use it to make predictions, right? Let me just remember how to do this because it's useful. I could use this to make predictions on my test data frame like that. I could make all these predictions for what the waves could be. Or I could, um, as a convenience, score how good those predictions are against my test DF of wave height. And I see, well, now I'm explaining 8.4% uh, of variance, right? So I did get a little bit lucky there. But still, I can say this is clearly better than, than my other models were. Hello, so when we started learning about uh, machine learning, the first kind of problem we talked about was regression. And after we learned about regression, we learned about some of the linear algebra underlying it. And now we're going to be moving on to a second kind of machine learning problem, which is classification. And, and so I just want to review the main categories of machine learning. Um, there's three main categories. Some people will say four. Uh, but there's reinforcement learning, um, which is about these multi-stage decisions. We're not doing that in 320. We're really interested in supervised machine learning, which is where we're trying to make some sort of prediction about uh, maybe the future or about some other unknown. And then there's unsupervised, where there's no particular thing that we're trying to predict, but we're looking for some sort of patterns or simplicity within the data. Um, we've been learning about regression, which is where we want to predict a quantity. And so we're going to be learning about the other um, most common kind of um, supervised machine learning, which is, well, how do we predict a category? And that's called classification. So just to review these, the two differences, um, here I have a big data frame. And all of these things here are features. And among these features, I have a mix of both um, uh, quantities and categories. And that's not really relevant looking at my features to figure out what kind of problem this is. When I want to think about what kind of problem it, I'm dealing with, I'll look at this label. What am I trying to predict? Is that quantitative or categorical? In this case, it's quantitative, so this is a regression problem. And so what will we do? I might have some data up here where, um, where both my features and my labels are known, and so I'll fit a model to that, and then I'll use that same model to predict uh, perhaps where that label is um, unknown. Or I might pretend it's unknown so I can uh, basically test the effectiveness of my model if that's some sort of test data set. The classification problem looks very similar. Again, I might have some mix of, um, of quantities or categories as my features. Um, the main difference now is that I have a categorical um, Y or label column. Otherwise, I'm still going to be fitting my features to my label and then trying to do some sort of prediction on it. So um, as I've mentioned, right, we have these four big categories. And uh, and sklearn has so many different algorithms for each of them or implementations for each of them. And so the one we've learned so far is linear regression. That's what we've been using for um, regression. So a linear regression model is what we call a regressor. Um, very confusingly, what we're going to be learning now is called a logistic regression. And it is not a regression. It's actually a classifier, right? So the name says linear regression, but it's classifier so don't get confused, right? Even though we're learning linear regression and logistic regression, I am teaching you a, regre a regression model and then also a classification model. So I'm going to exit out of here and head over to my notebook to try to introduce this. And let me see here. Here is my notebook. I have some stuff imported. Maybe I'll come back to that later. Um, let me just jump down here for now. Um, I have this data frame 
which has some data from a very um, famous machine learning data set called the iris data set the idea of the iris data set is that you have all these measurements about um, iris flowers so for example um, what is the size of the petals uh, what is the length or width of the sepals which are the i guess like the green leaves between the petals um, there are different varieties of, um, of irises. So I put the varieties here in this far right column. This whole thing I'm looking at right now is a, is a test data set and it only has 10 samples in it, um, which is tiny, right? Normally we'd have a much larger um, test data set, but I'm just trying to keep it small and simple um, in this case. I'm passing in this random state so that even though it's um, uh, somewhat random, I mean, every time I run it, it'll be the same. If I put a different number here, I would get a different random, and I'm using random kind of carefully uh, order each time. So this is just so I can reproduce it even though I want something basically random. I want random but reproducible. So I've done that train test split, and I'm just putting 10 here. And so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be um, fitting different models to the training data and then uh, just seeing how they act with this very small um, test data set. And um, looking at this, there are three features I'm going to be interested in. We're going to look at the dimensions of the sepals, and then I have this constant column. Um, remember that sometimes when you have these models, you could have coefficients in a separate intercept, or you could just have coefficients, and then the last coefficient could be multiplying the one column. And that's what I'm doing here. I think I'll make the later examples a little bit simpler. Those are my features. Um, I actually have multiple Y columns here. I'm going to try to see if I can predict different things over here. Can I predict what the petal width is? And I predict whether or not a particular variety um, is a setosa. Um, there's actually three varieties um, in general, so can I just predict any variety? You can see that whenever I have a setosa here, uh, it's true. For other cases, it's false, right? It's not a setosa. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to see if I can predict these three different columns based on these three different features. I guess it's really like two features. And so there's four things we're going to do. We're going to do a regression uh, on the pedal width, and that's really just kind of review. Uh, we're going to do a binary classification uh, on the Satosa column. And so we're going to try to predict whether it's true or false. Binary means two, and, and so that's why um, there are just two things here. Oh, it's either true or false. Uh, I'm going to use that same model to not just tell me whether it's true or, true or false. I'm going to ask the model um, for some sort of probability uh, that it's true and probability that it's false. Um, rather than just saying, hey, it's true, I'd like to see something like, oh, there's a 95% chance it's true. And then finally, so multi binary means two, multi class means, um, uh, I guess, more than two. And so we're going to do that over here, right? You can see I have three different categories here, and things get a little bit more complicated in that situation. Okay, so I'm going to head down here, and I am going to first just start with a regression. And so I'm going to say regression equals linear regression. This is just review from before. And I have all these options in here. And this fit intercept one is something I'm actually going to turn to be false. So fit intercept equals false. What, what this normally does, if it's true, is it would add this one's column um, for me effectively. When I'm saying uh, false, because, well, I've already done that manually. And that just is going to make my example a little cleaner later on. So I have this thing, and I want to fit it to some data. So I'm going to say uh, uh, regression.fit. And when I fit, what do I do? I have my x and my y. And then after that, I could do uh, regression.predict uh, on maybe some other x's. And then that would return a y, right? So I'd have something like this. Maybe I'll say like y, y2, and x2. So in my particular example, I have my training and test data. And so... Uh, what am I trying to predict right now? I'm trying to predict the pedal width. Right? So I'm going to copy this column name, and I am going to, when I'm um, doing my um, when I'm doing my fitting, I'm going to pull that out of my training data. Right? So I'm going to put that in here in quotes. That's my y, and then then my x. Well, it will be um, it will be again my training data, and then I have to have like some columns here. I guess a list of columns. And so I actually already created that. Right here I have these x columns. Those are the sepal length, sepal width, and then constant. And so this will be my list that I put inside of here. And so I'll basically get those three columns. Let me just 
So um, if anybody's having trouble visualizing it, I'm, I'm getting just those three columns out of my bigger, bigger one. Whereas when I'm doing this, I'm going to get a panda series that contains that uh, pedal width column. So I'm trying to predict this based on, on these three things. Okay, so I'm doing that, and now I want to do some predictions down here, and, and that's going to be the same, right? I'm going to put in um, X that's basically the same format, except now I'm going to use my test data, and, and maybe rather than capture that in a variable, I'll just see what it looks like for now. So these are my predictions for what should go in this uh, pedal width column. And, and so if I wanted to, I could maybe even add those into my training data frame, my test data frame, and I could say my prediction um, equals that. And then I could look at my test data frame. And the thing that it's complaining about is that I'm trying to add some values to a slice of another, um, of another data set. So when I did this here, right, it's, these are slices of the rows inside of my big data frame. And so it gets confused when I'm trying to add columns to one of these. That's not in the original. So it's actually an easy thing to fix. I could just say like test equals test.copy. And then test will be completely detached from my data frame. And I can add columns to it uh, without complaint. So let me, let me run that. And now I can see I have this prediction column over here. And, and I could go through and see how these predictions are. So I predict 1.3. It's actually 1.2. I predict one point. 5, 9, actually 1.4. Um, and so I can see sometimes the predictions are good and sometimes they're, well, not so great. Anyway, that's a regression. Um, let me, this was this part one here, let, let me go on and, and try this next piece. I want to do a binary classification on this column right here. And so the code is actually going to be very similar to before. I'm going to head down here. I'm going to change a few things. First off, I want to have a logistic regression and remember uh it is a classifier despite the name right so i can deal with a category like this and then for my y i'm going to just have the satosa column is it a satosa variety or is it not and so i'm doing that i may also rename this just so we remember it's a classifier i'm going to call it cls then um, down here I also need CLS, and I do that, and now I can see my predictions here. I can see that this column is telling me what the flower actually is, and this column over here is telling me what the model predicts it is. And actually, I guess um, uh, we're doing quite well here, right? Every one of our predictions um, is completely accurate, uh, which is great. All right, let me let me go back up here to the different things we want to do. So we did the regression using linear regression. We did the binary classification using logistic regression. And, and then basically saying, well, do I have a true or false? Now what I'd actually like to do is know, well, what is the probability of getting um, a true? And so I can do that like this. I can say, um, uh, this has an extra function. It's very similar to the predict, but it'll be like this. It'll be um, predict probability a, and I'm going to get a NumPy array of all the probabilities. And so what this means is the way I'd interpret this is that there's a 94% chance of false and a 5% chance of true. And that's why it ultimately reduced that to a false. 97.9% uh, chance of false and, and only a 2% chance of true. That's why I get another false. Let me look at this one. This one had a, a 90, about 93% chance of being true, which is why I have true, um, true there. And, and so I could even, if I wanted to, I could try to pull out that last column. I could say something like, I want to have some sort of slicing where I have like a row slice and then a column slice when I'm doing this. I want all the rows and, uh, and I want that second column. These are just the probabilities of it being true. And so if I wanted to, I could say something like test, um, test of probability equals that. And then I could look at it again. And, um, and I can kind of see in each case, well, based on these dimensions, uh, what probability does the model think it has of being a Satosa? Um, and, and so sometimes it's not quite sure, right? I could, based on this, I could identify the cases where the model uh, was not very confident. And then I could identify other cases well, where it was quite obvious um, what it was. So I don't have to do a new model for that. I just have to call predict probability A instead of predict. And um, okay, so let me head up here.
And we're going to do this last piece now. Um, how can I do a multi-class classification uh, on variety? And variety is a little bit trickier because I have three different categories there. Um, I, I guess it's going to be trickier when we actually get into the math behind it, but it is not trickier in terms of um, it is not trickier in terms of uh, actually running the code. So if I actually copy this here, um, and then I head down here. I'm just going to call this uh, multi, so I can remember my three different models. And I'm going to say multi, and um, and then what else do I need to change? I'm doing a different column this time, and so I can do that. And now, now what? It's going to tell me for my predictions. Um, I see my it's saying my predictions are still uh, false and true, and that came from here, and so this is returning true and false because. Oh, well, my new model is called multi, and I'm using my old model. I'm going to do that, and now I can uh, see while we're writing that. I can see well, what was it predict for this one? That one it got right. That one it got right. Here it actually made a mistake, right? Um, models make mistakes. That's not that's not surprising. I guess that was the only mistake in this data set. And then of course this probability column was from earlier, right? So I'm just going to ignore that um because i keep on writing this probability um or this prediction column for each of my um four examples okay so there we've seen a few different things right we've seen a regression and then we've seen these two different kinds of classifications um let's try to get into the um let's try to get into the linear algebra behind each of these examples and so i'm gonna head down here and remember that i had reg that was my uh, model earlier and um and inside of here i have coefficient and i also have intercept and the intercept is zero because earlier what happened i passed in that intercept equals false to all of these uh, if i had not done that then what would have happened then my coefficients i only had these two columns here or two numbers here corresponding to the weights on these two columns and then instead of this being uh, basically my intercept, that would have gone to the separate variable down here instead of being here. So basically, these are my weights on my real columns. And then this is the, the intercept or the weight on my ones column. Okay, so I have that thing. And what I'd like to do is uh, reshape it so that it can be, um, I want it to be however many rows necessary and then one column. So it'll be vertical like that. Um, the other thing I want to do is I want to get my x data, which will be my um, will be my uh, test data frame, and then it'll be those x columns, and maybe I'll say um, dot values, and so I'll look at that. So I'm pulling those first three columns out of here. Okay, so I have three columns here, and then the column over here is basically three entries in it, and so if I wanted to, I could take the dot product of this with these down down here and that's exactly how um, a linear regression does predictions so if i come down here so i can say define a reg, um, uh, regression uh, predict and if i have some x values here what i could do is i could return uh, x dot uh, basically these things right so i could say um, maybe i'll call this like vector one or i'll, I'll call it coefficient uh, you know what, I'm just going to actually, why not just put it here directly? I don't need a separate variable for that. And so I'm going to look at this regression predict, and I'm going to do it on my x data, and I get these predictions, um, 1.32, 1.59. Let me actually um, draw up here earlier, and I see that those are exactly the predictions that my linear regression made earlier, 1.32, 1.59, right? So this um, regular uh, regression dot predict like this all it's doing is this right here it's doing this this math right like this okay let's try to see what the logistic regression is doing so it's actually going to be very similar so remember before what was i doing i was saying uh cls my classifier dot predict and um and i can just do that these were the values i was getting out of my classifier what math is this doing it's actually almost identical to this 
Let me copy this. In fact, I'm just trying to tweak it very slightly. I'm going to have my uh, CLS predict. And then I'm going to say CLS uh, predict. And my X data. And, um, and the difference, right? I have these all these numbers now. And, and actually, sorry. <laughs> I want my coefficients from my other one. So my CLS coefficients. I should look at those as well before I jump into this. I may have different coefficients. I'm like, oh, why are all the numbers the same? That doesn't make sense. And I get all these numbers. And, and remember, our goal is to predict false, false, or true, or things like that. And, and so the way it works is that we're getting a score for each entry. And if the score is greater than zero, uh, we predict true, otherwise we pr predict false. And so the shape is a little bit different here. Maybe I can just reshape so it's more obvious. Uh, but otherwise, that's what it's doing. All these numbers up here are the same, same down here. And, and, and I think maybe this is why they, um, maybe they even call this logistic regression, even though uh, it's a classifier. The math is basically identical to um, what we have for a linear regression, right? The, at the heart of it, we're just doing a dot product. The only difference between the linear regression that we did before and the logistic regression we're doing now is we're just checking if some number is greater than zero. Okay, so let's do this next piece, right? So the next piece was, I'm kind of going back through my examples before, um, after we um, did predict, which was trying to say, well, are we predicting true or false? We wanted to get this probability. What is the probability that's a setosa? And so how can we get a probability out of this? If I head back down here, you actually see that before I added this um, greater than, I had a numeric score. So I'm going to go back to that. And I'm going to say I want to predict probability A now. I'm just going to go back to this. And um, predict my probability. And I'm going to do that. And I see I have all these scores. And of course, these are not probabilities because a probability would be between 0 and 1. But it turns out there's a very simple function that can turn it into a probability. And that function is called the sigmoid function. And I had it at the beginning of the, the notebook, but I haven't talked about it yet. So I'm just going to head up briefly, and we're going to talk about the sigmoid function and how we're going to use it. We don't have to go into a lot of the details on the math. I don't care if you remember that. I certainly don't remember it. The important thing for it is that the x value that's going in can be as large or as small as we want. But if I if I get very, very negative numbers, I effectively approach zero. And if I get very large numbers, I effectively uh, approach one. So the nice thing is that I could take any sort of numeric score in, and it's going to give me back a result between zero and one. So basically, I can take some other sort of score and turn it into something that at least looks like a probability. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to call this sigmoid function down here, right? And so instead of having all these numbers like negative 2.76 or, or 2.57, I'm just going to take the sigmoid of all of those things, and then they will be uh, these numbers all between 0 and 1. And it turns out that that's how we were um, would actually be doing the probabilities, right? So just like before, I was trying to say, well, predict, um, uh, predict the category on x. Uh, the same way down here, if I, um, maybe I'll do this, uh, right here above, I'm going to say predict the probability of A. Let, let me just look at what's happening here. These numbers right here, which is the probability of it being true, is this column right here, the probability of it being true. Um, the way I've written this code, I'm not computing the probability of it being false because, well, that's boring, right? I mean, they add up to one, so why would I do both of them? But you can see these numbers here are exactly identical this down here, right? So again, the probability is very simple, right? I'm, I'm still just doing that core um, dot product, and then I'm just applying the sigmoid to every number um, inside of the, the result, right? So we've seen for all these cases so far, this dot product is just extremely important, right? I'm taking the dot product of a matrix uh, with a vertical vector. Let me go up and talk about the fourth model we did with a multi-class model. Uh, the multi-class model uh, was right here, and I was trying to predict variety. And variety uh, could be any one of these three things. And what it's going to turn out is that my coefficients for variety 
um, are going to be a lot more complicated. So if I look at, so this is my binary one, if I look at the coefficients for my binary one, I just have these three numbers. But if I look at my coefficients for my uh, multi-class regression, I actually have not a vector, but a whole matrix with all of these, all of these numbers in it. And, um, and so uh, let me, um, let me uh, use these now. And what we're going to do is actually, I think just like the way they set it up, we're going to have to transpose them. We're going to do that. And let me, let me grab this here. It's going to be very similar again, but instead of multiplying x by just a vertical vector, I am going to multiply it by this whole thing right here. We multiply it by that whole thing. And then I get this result. And so I'm going to just call this quickly. I'm sorry, this is multi-predict now. Multi-predict. And I'm going to call that multi-predict of x. And I'm actually not doing a sigmoid anymore at this point. My apologies. And so how do I interpret this? Basically, um, every one of these columns corresponds to one of the three varieties. If I had had more varieties, I would have had more columns up here, but I would have still had three rows in this coefficient matrix. Right, so you might imagine, I don't know if, which one is which, but you might imagine that this is the, the Satosa variety. And it turns out when I take my big matrix of data and I multiply it by all of these columns right here, what it really does is it throws column by column. It takes this column times my data matrix, and it uses that to produce this output column. So these might be the scores for how much it looks like a Satosa. And then maybe let's say these are the coefficients for a Versicolor. Then these would be the scores for a Versicolor. If uh, these were the coefficients for a Virginica, then these might be uh, the scores for the Virginica. And so what I can do is that each one of these rows corresponds to a row in my original data, which means this row corresponds to one particular flower, one particular iris. And so for that one particular iris, I have a score. How much is it like a, a Satosa? How much is it like a Versicolor? How much is it like a, um, a Virginica? And so what I can do is I can try to take these and I can see which score is the highest. And in this case, it's this middle one. So whatever, uh, whatever type of iris corresponds to that middle column is what I'd want to predict. And so I can check that. I could say, um, uh, if I go back to this, I could say, I think it's classes. Um, I could see, okay, well, this, I, I guess, I guess, well, this is the Satosa. And so that first one would be a Versicolor, right? And, and, and so one of the ways I could actually do this is um, there's a, um, it turns out that there is an ARD, um, ARD min call. Let me just try to do this here and make sure I get it right. Uh, I am getting it right, okay. And so what, um, or I guess I want ARD max. What this is going to do is it's going to give me which index, um, is basically giving me the largest value. But I have to specify what axis. And I um, zero is down and one is across. So I'm gonna say one. And what is this telling me? I'm gonna reshape it so it's a little bit more obvious. I'm gonna say um, negative one, one. What this means is that um, at index one, I have the biggest number in that first place. The second position, the biggest number is here. Is that true? Yeah, that's true. This number is bigger than those other ones. Let me check the fourth one. That means the zeroth position is bigger. So this is bigger than these. So that's absolutely true. And so what's cool about if I have a NumPy array like this, I can put that into another NumPy um, array like this. So I can, I can take these classes and I can put this array of numbers into here. And I'm going to get basically, well, what are all these categories? And so I'm going to take all of this and, um, and I'm going to put it back in here. And I can see that then I'm going to get the predictions for all my, um, for all of my, for all of my flowers, right? I can see for each of them, well, what am I predicting it, it is? 
right? And this will correspond with my predictions earlier, right? So again, that product is at the heart of it. Um, but now, since I have uh, different possible classes, I have to have coefficients to get a score for each class. And so that's why um, uh, we have to multiply the data by a full matrix instead of just a vector. And that's the first example we've seen like that, uh, a real practical use case in this course. Hello, in this video, I want to talk about how we can visualize um, the decisions or predictions that are made by a classifier. When we were doing regressions, we'd often visualize this by drawing a fit line. And the equivalent here is that we'll often, um, at least when we have two features, is we'll draw those two features on an x and y axis, and then we'll uh, separate the area into two different regions, one where we predict um, uh, true and another area where we predict false. And so the, the, the function that we're we'll be using in Matplotlib is called contour f, and it can, and can do that kind of plot. So we want to evaluate CLS, and the idea is that we want to put in a bunch of different uh, values for, uh, for both sepal length, which I'm going to put on the y-axis, and sepal width, which I'll put on the x-axis. And so the way to get every combination of these, um, maybe most easily, is with a NumPy mesh grid. And the reason I'm using a mesh grid is that um, it creates some arrays with different combinations in exactly the form that I'm going to need uh, later. So it creates um, arrays and form needed for contour f later. And so let me eventually leave this comment here like that. And what is it trying to return? Well, it's trying to return two arrays. It's trying to return one, uh, which is... Um, one of my variables and the other one will be the other variable. So, so maybe I'll say um, I'll put my uh, sepal uh, width first and then my sepal length, just like that. And then what I have to do here is I have to have a range, right? So I'll have like um, range one and range two. And really what the mesh grid is going to do is it's going to give me every combination of these two ranges. So here I'll say NP um, A range, maybe I'll go from zero to uh, 0 to 10 and maybe do a 0 0.1 step and then the same thing over here as well. Okay so I have those two and, and let me just take a look at what these things look like. I see that both of these are a 2 by 2 matrix that are showing me every combination. So um, let me look at the other one as well. So these are exactly the same shape and the values in it are just giving you the, the, the coordinates right. So um, the first one is giving me the x coordinate, basically the sepal width, and the other one is going to give me the y, y coordinate, coordinate or the sepal length. And so, if I wanted to, I could um, I could then call uh, plt dot contour f, and this is taking three things. It has to have my matrix of my um, uh, x x coordinates, and it has to have my matrix of my y coordinates, and then it has to have something that says um, that uh, gives the color, right? And that can be some sort of um, uh, kind of expression, right? So I could say if I wanted to sepal W, and this will show me some stripes from left to right, or I could do uh, sepal L, and that'll show me vertical, um, or I could have some sort of mathematical expression, right, like this. And at each point, it's showing me what would happen if I multiply the value in one of these by the value in the other, so I can get these nice contour maps. Now, what I'd really like to do is um, is to just have two levels, two numbers. Maybe let me just show show you what this is now. Um, lots of different numbers. I'd like to just have two numbers here, basically one and a zero, um, that correspond to predictions, right? So it'll be my x-axis is going to be the sepal width, and my y-axis will be the sepal length. So I have to get all this data into a format where I can do some um, predictions, right? So let me let me leave this here for now. And we come back to this. This is my my goal where I'm working towards. Um, what I would like to do is put these things in a data frame. So I'm going to say um, this will be my contour data frame. I'm going to say pd dot dot data frame, and my data frame has to have all of these things up here, right? Because I want to do predictions on it, and these are my x columns, and so I'm going to have something for that. Um, I may have something for that. And then I'll do my constant first. That's easy. That's just one. Uh, these values I can pull from, from these. Um, and so I can put this here. 
and then I could put um, up here, I could put sap w if I wanted to. Now this is not gonna quite work because um, these are those um, uh, basically square matrices. And down here, I'm trying to put all this in a data frame so I can do uh, my predictions. It has to just be a simple column. So I have to flatten these. So it's um, uh, just kind of one dimensional. And um, I can do that and then I can look at my CDF if I like. And I, I can see what is going on here is I really have every combination of length and width, and then I have my constant column. So this is in a great format for me to then do um, some predictions because I can just say it has everything that I need for my predictor, right? I can say um, cls.predict, just like that. And then I get all of these values um, right here. And if I wanted to, I could add those. Um, to that data frame as well. I could say CDF. Um, I could say uh, predicted. Maybe I'll just say a prediction. And, and I remember that was the, the pedal width is what I'm trying to predict. I can say, or I'm sorry, it was the category. Is it uh, Setosa or not? Right? So that's what I'm trying to do. Okay. So I have that. And, um, and now I'd like to pr um, be um, going down and doing my uh, doing my uh, contour plot down here, right? So I, I can have this and let me think a little bit carefully here, right? So if I have my set W, let me look at the shape of these. That's a 100 by 100 because that's what my range was. I was drawing over 100 numbers. This is a 100 by 100 matrix. This is a 100 by 100 matrix. This is also going to have to be a 100 by 100 matrix. Right now it's just this long column so just like I have to had to convert these matrices um, to columns with a reshape here, now I have to go in the opposite direction. I have to take values and then reshape this to be matching the format of these, right? So I can actually just use these uh, and say, well, my prediction should be whatever shape my X values are. And so that'll line up nicely. And so I can do that. Now I can see, well, the two sides of this are going to correspond to a prediction of it being um, either um, a setosa or not a setosa. Let me um, plot those with a scatter plot on top of here. Um, I have my data frame here of all my original uh, flowers. I'm going to plot all of them. Ideally, I would just um, plot only the training data on top of this so I can actually have a better sense of how, what errors are made. Uh, but I only have like 10 rows of my, my um, testing data. And so I'm just going to plot the whole thing. So I'm going to say uh, dot plot dot scatter and actually what I'd like to do is I'd like to just separate this out so I may have something like setosa uh, dot plot dot scatter and then I may have something like other dot plot dot scatter and then those things I can get just with some filtering right so I'm going to say setosa equals data frame uh, where data frame of uh, variety uh, equals setosa and then my other ones will be basically where it's not that. So I'll say where it is not Satosa. Okay, so what am I going to do down here? Well, I may say my x value is going to be, um, well, I was putting sepal width there, so I better put that sepal width on my x axis. And then my y axis should be sepal length. Okay, so I'm going to do that, and I'm going to do the same thing down here for a moment. And I see, okay, well, I have my decision boundaries, and then I have um, my two separate plots down here. I'd like these to all be on the same plot. And normally, the way that we've done things like that is we would say AX equals this, and then we'd pass that down below. Let me just show you quickly what the type of AX would be if I were to do that. It's this thing here, this um, quad contour set, and we cannot plot on top of that. So if I wanted to reuse the same um, axis subplot area, what I can actually do is I can say matplotlib dot it current axis, and that will give me an axis subplot that I can pass in elsewhere. Right, so I could say up here, I could say, um, uh, maybe I'll go on to the next line, I could say ax equals that, and same thing here. Um, so then they'll, they'll all go to the same area. So let me do that. And so I have all of these points, and um, 
And, and so then what I'd like to do now is, um, well, it's kind of strange that it's not overlapping that boundary. Um, did I get my axes mix, mixed up? Uh, I did. So here is sepal width, sepal length. Okay, great. So let me let me just switch this back. So this should have been sepal length, and this should have been sepal width. And now I can actually see that makes a lot more sense how you can try to separate the ones that are from the ones that are not. And, and so to actually uh, make this work now, I should have the color be different in some way. So I'm going to have the setosas be uh, red, and then maybe I'll have the other ones be, um, I, I, I don't know, maybe it can be gray. All right, so just like that. And so now I can start to see um, what mistakes will be made. I can see that there's one setosa that is not going to be recognized as a setosa because it's on the wrong side of this boundary. Um, I should probably also have some um, labels here. So I'm going to say like label equals setosa. And then down here, maybe I'll say uh, label equals equals other, just like that. And so I can see what's happening here now. And, and so there's a couple steps to all of this, right? Um, maybe I can delete these extra things up here so I can have a minimal example. I had to create a mesh grid and that basically for every point, it, it, one grid had the X values, another one had the Y values. Um, I had to reshape those to turn, convert them to data frame uh, columns. And then at, at that point, I really had every combination of these in some row. Once I did that, I could add predictions for basically every combination. And then if I converted um, uh, my predictions back to the mesh grid format like these two have, then I could do my contour. And that's how I could create this map. Uh, and then on top of that, I could plot my scatter points and see what's happening. Uh, one last thing I want to do here, and that is I want to try to do some polynomial um, uh, FETs. So just like we can use polynomial features for a regular regression, I can use those for classification as well. And so let me import some stuff. I'm going to say from sklearn uh, dot pipeline import pipeline, and I'm going to say from sklearn dot preprocessing. I'm going to say import polynomial features. Okay. And so before, what did I have? I had um, I just had a logistic regression like this with um, with what, what was it? It was um. I'm just trying to search up in my page earlier. I think it was this fit intercept thing that I had off for all of them. Excuse me. So I had that. This is my model before. And that's trying to be part of a pipeline, right? So now I'm going to say pipe equals pipeline. And the pipeline is going to be this list of stages, just like this. And so that'll be the first stage. Well, I'm sorry, that'll be the last stage. And then before that, I want to have my polynomial features, just like that. And um, then the other trick is, is that each stage of my pipeline has to be a tuple. And the reason it has to be a tuple is because I have to give it a name, right? So I guess I'll just call this poly and I'll call this one LR. So I have that and it's straight. And so just like before I could have my, um, uh, I think before I had something like this fit and then I had a uh, train of X columns and then train of what was my y column i guess it was um uh it was going to be my pedal width i think so let me let me just copy that it was like this but it was pedal width that's what i was doing before and i can just replace my uh logistic regression with this pipe so let me try that and i get some sort of error here Unknown label type continuous. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm I'm trying to predict the whether or not it's a setosa, right? It, it's complaining because it's continuous. So it's saying, hey, you're trying to do a classification on a quantity, which we don't do classifications on quantity. We do regressions on quantities. So what I'm going to say here is setosa. Is it a setosa? That's what I care about. And then I train it, and that's all great. Now, if I want to, I can come back here and I can repeat these um, these steps, right? So I could, um, if I wanted to, maybe I'm just going to move all of this up here. And then when I'm plotting this, when I want to look at those decision boundaries, instead of using my simple classifier before, I could use my 
pipeline classifier. And then what's going to happen? Well, that boundary line between them is just slightly more curved. It doesn't quite help. That red point is still on the wrong side. But um, you can see I can get different shapes depending on the complexity of, of my model and what I have in the pipeline beforehand. Hello, in this video, I'm going to be talking a little bit um, about how we can score our models um, on our training data. And um, scoring them is going to involve learning some new metrics and terminology. Uh, it turns out there's different kinds of errors. And um, and if sometimes we'll, we'll care more about uh, one kind of error than another, uh, we might want to use different metrics to deal with that case. Um, so for this, I have some really simple dummy data. Uh, basically, I have this data frame um, that has an X column, and the X column is a number, and then the Y column is a, is a Boolean, and it's true whenever X is positive and false when it's negative. Okay, so not much data there. And, um, and just for simplicity, I'm kind of breaking it into the first half and the second half. I wouldn't normally do this, right, because maybe the data is not shuffled, and maybe I'm kind of getting very different data in the two halves. So this is just trying for an example. There I have it, I have my training data, my test data down here and um, and if i want to try to figure out what is the relationship between y and x and then uh, measure uh, the model's understanding of that relationship um, i'm going to use some sort of scoring function right so i'm going to do this with a logistic regression um remember this is not really a regression it's actually a classifier right because i have this categorical data that i'm trying to predict and so i'm going to train one of those and then i want to score it so First step, right, is I'm going to say LR equals logistic regression. Great. And, um, and then I'm going to say LR.fit. And when I'm fitting, let me actually just try to run this. Uh, once I run it, I can actually sit shift tab and, and get a hint. Um, I have to give it the X data and the Y data. And so I'm going to give it both those things from the training data first. And so I'm going to say training data, and, um, and then the columns I want are just x. And then the thing I'm trying to predict is just the y value, just like that. And then after I do that, I can uh, basically uh, run a command that's very similar, and that command is score. I can evaluate how well it does on the test data. And I get uh, 0.75. Um, so what is this score function doing? Um, it turns out it's a shortcut, and, um, and I'm just going to show you a little bit in the documentation what it's doing. If I head over here, I see that the score function for the logistic regression is giving me the mean accuracy. And if you look at other estimators, um, they might be doing other kinds of, uh, using other metrics for the scoring. Okay, so mean accuracy, um, so that's the default here, uh, but it turns out there's lots of different metrics we could use. And so if I go to the metrics page for um, scikit-learn, I can see that, hey, there's a whole bunch of um, metrics here related to classification, uh, clustering, which we haven't talked about yet, and then um, a whole bunch related to regression as well. And so the one I'm using right now, the default, is that accuracy score, right? You saw that, how it's saying here, that we're um, just getting the accuracy, and accuracy is very simple. It's, well, what percentage of the times um, did we get it right? And so I certainly could have, instead of using that score function, I could have used this one myself. And I think that's a good thing to do right now, because once you understand how to use this manually uh, without the shortcut, then we'll understand how to use these other functions as well. Okay, so I can see this is in the metrics um, submodule. And so when I head back here, I'm going to do this. I'm going to say, uh, and this was that page I was just on, I am going to say from uh, from sklearn.metrics import accuracy score. Okay, and, um, and let me just run that. And when I call accuracy score, I hit shift tab here. Um, basically what I'm doing is I'm saying, well, what are the true values and what did my model predict? Okay, and, and so there's different ways I could do that. I mean, I could say, well, the true values are A and, and B, uh, but I actually predicted A and C, and it turns out if I do that, well, I'm just 50% right, right? So this was my 
actual values and my, um, and my predicted values. Um, so let me actually try to get these uh, from up above, right? So before I was trying this score thing, um, and then I was trying to give me my X values and my Y values. And, and so I'm gonna pull pieces from this. Um, the first piece I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually figure out what the predicted values are. So those are gonna be the predicted values and I actually have to call predict here instead of score, right? When I'm predicting, I'm not giving it any Y values, right? Predict tells me what the Y values are. And, um, and then I also have to have my actual, right? And my actual was just the second piece from before on that column. So, so maybe actually let me just do this. I'm gonna say, let me look at the actual values and the predicted values. Um, as a list, okay, and I can see the actual were true, true, false, false, uh, but I'm actually getting true, false, 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 and so the second one is the error, right? So I'm going to be wrong 25% of the time, and so accuracy is actually going to be 75%, um, which is what we saw before, and we're going to see it here too when we actually pass in. Uh, these two things I pass in the actual values and those predicted values right so I'm gonna get that 75 percent okay now so that works fine uh, but there's gonna be cases where we don't want to just know how often we're right but we want to know about um, uh, you know about what kind of mistakes we're making right so for example um, what let's imagine different things that this y column might be um, let's say that this Y column means it's a good investment. Maybe it's um, for a stock or something. Um, I don't need to know about every good investment, uh, but if I have some system that kind of tells me like, hey, these are some good investments and it's always right, and it doesn't tell me about every good investment, that's a pretty good system. Um, in contrast, maybe this is telling me, um, I don't know, is somebody contagious for COVID-19 or whatever, right? And in that case, um, it's much safer to make the mistake of saying they are contagious even though they're not. And so there's different kinds of errors, false positives and the false negatives. And so there's a lot of metrics based on that. And uh, the simplest place to start is with something called um, a confusion matrix. And a confusion matrix um, shows the categories that things actually are and then how they mistakenly get classified as other things. And so just like before, just like we have an actual and a predicted list, when we have a confusion matrix, we're gonna do the same thing. So imagine I had pictures of animals and, um, and you know, I had four dogs, three cats, and two mice. And, um, but then I have some machine learning system that's looking at those pictures and is maybe predicting these other things. Um, what I could do is I could um, create a confusion matrix uh, using scikit-learn, right? This is also under metrics, just like accuracy score. And so I can create one of these. And, um, and just like with the accuracy score, I can uh, put the true values and then the predicted values or something like that. So I'm gonna say actual and predicted. And, um, and this is a little bit confusing because um, each one of these values is kind of showing us how many uh, categories fall into like a specific actual category and a predicted category. And um, it's not really clear to line it up, right? Well, is, is this first row dog or is it cat? And so what people will often do, right, is that they'll say labels like this and um, just to control the order. order. So for example, maybe I want to say like um, cat, uh, dog, uh, mouse, just like that. And, um, and then if I pass in these labels, uh, it's going to be a little bit different, right? Whereas if I say dog, cat, you can see these numbers switched a little. And another reason for this, besides just controlling the order, right, so that makes sense, is that I could, um, you know, maybe there's things that uh, I know exist, but didn't even show up in the data, right? There's no horses, right? Um, so, so let me actually really kind of talk about what these numbers mean. I think it'll be a little easier to put in a data frame. And, um, and so I'm gonna put this in a confusion matrix here. And now let me put this in a data frame, a pd.data frame, confusion matrix. And, and when I'm creating a data frame from this, both the index and column labels are going to be the same, right? So I'm going to have, have it just be like this. And, and so when I'm looking at this confusion matrix, what does it mean? So uh, the row means what it actually is. And uh, the column 
is going to be what it got classified as. All right, so I can see in this right that there's four dogs, and um, of those four dogs, it correctly classified three of them as dogs, um, but one of the dogs was mistakenly uh, identified as a cat. Okay, it looks like there are three cats in the system. Two of them were correctly identified as cats, and one was considered a dog. Um, and then I can see other things here, like, well, the system's really good at mice, right? It always correctly calls the mice and doesn't mix them up with anything. And, um, and so this is useful, right? When I have a list try matrix, I can see what ways um, the classifier is confused, hence it's called a, a, um, you know, a confusion matrix, right? It's trying to be how the model is confused. Right, um, so hopefully that's helpful. Now, uh, it's very common that we'll be having these uh, confusion matrices where the classes, instead of being, um, you know, different animals, it might just be true and false. That that would be for a binary classifier where I just have these true and false values. And so let me actually go back to what I had before, right? When I was computing this um, accuracy score. And uh, let me create a confusion matrix here. And, and maybe I'm just gonna copy some of this uh, down here. I'm just gonna grab this. And uh, in this case, the labels are false and true. And it doesn't do anything. Okay, so I have these different categories. And just like before, I think it's gonna be helpful to put this in a, in a data frame, right? Uh, I'm gonna put a data frame here just like that. And so here, again, the row is telling me what it actually is. And then uh, the column is telling me how those got, got classified. And ideally in a perfect world, right, everything will be on the diagonal, right? That means um, uh, there were no mistakes made, there was no confusion. Okay, so I have that and um, and, and it turns out there are special names for each of these four uh, values. And so I'm just going to go through this quickly. Um, the, the top left one, actually, let's start with the bottom right. So if I go to, uh, if I go to, let me put this in a date, actual data frame. Uh, so that's going to be my confusion matrix as a data frame now. Okay. And, um, and if I go iloc one one, that's going to be that bottom right. That's going to be called true positives. And you're going to practice kind of remembering these these words. They're important terminology, right? So I'm going to do this. And then if I had been smart with this example, I would have made sure all these numbers were different so we could more easily identify, right? And um, and then the other numbers on the top left. And those are true negatives, right? So true means that that the model is doing the correct thing, right? So in this case, I have uh, a one. You know what I should really do is I should do it like this: true positives, true negatives, right? People often abbreviate it this way. And then there's the mistakes, right? The mistakes are false, right? So I'm going to say false and false. And, um, and so what are these called? The false positives? Well, where, where are those? So false positive means that in this column, right? And so it should be false, right? That's what the, it actually is in the data, uh, but the, it gets classified as true, right? So, so what does that mean? I, that means I'm in row zero, column one, and then the opposite down here, right? Sometimes, uh, it actually is true, but the model says it's false. That's a false negative and um, false negative, just like that. All right, so these are the four different ca uh, cases I'd have. And a lot of the statistics we're going to be looking at in the next video are combinations of these, and I'll be kind of talking more about why those are meaningful. In the last video, we learned a little bit about uh, confusion matrices. And uh, confusion matrices give you the whole picture but often we want to summarize things in just one or two numbers. And uh, one of those most important numbers, which we've already seen, is accuracy. Um, accuracy tells us what percentage of the time our model is correct. And, uh, but when it gets it wrong, it doesn't really tell us what kind of mistakes are being made. And so we're going to be learning two metrics, recall and precision. 
um, which really you can think of as accuracy on a subset of the data, right? So there's still going to be fractions uh, between zero and one, and um, but they'll kind of help us pinpoint where the mistakes are actually being made. Okay, so to review, here's a confusion matrix. Um, along the rows, I have what the data actually is. And along the columns, I have what the model thinks it is. And so right now I have zeros in all these places. Uh, but if I were to see an actual mouse, and um, and the model predicted that it's a mouse, then I would go to the mouse row and the mouse column and, and increment that number by one, right? And that's good. Anytime we're incrementing numbers on the diagonal or confusion matrix, uh, that means we made the right decision. Um, here's an example of a wrong decision. If our model took a look at that picture, which is clearly a dog um, and needs need of some grooming, uh, and it predicted it's a cat, then we go to the dog row because it's actually a dog and the cat column because that's what was predicted and increment that. And so we might do this over our whole data set and we have a bunch of numbers there. Now from that, we might want to uh, figure out what the accuracy is. And the accuracy is, well, what percentage of the times were we correct? And so the way I think of that is adding up all the numbers on the diagonal. That's how many we got correct. And then dividing by all the numbers in the matrix, right? So then look at eight over 10 or 80 percent and some observations here is that you know this number is a fraction of kind of a subset over a larger amount so it's always be going to be between zero and one and uh, the good number is always in the numerator for accuracy so uh, one is the best possible number and so precision and recall have those same properties but they're going to be a lot of different subsets of the matrix right we are going to be taking the whole diagonal divided by the whole whole matrix um, so precision and recall, it turns out we can actually have these metrics uh, for each class, right? So I'm actually going to have um, six different metrics here. I have dog recall, cat recall, mouse recall, and then similar dog precision, cat precision, and mouse precision. And so I'm just going to look at a few of these. So when I'm asking, well, what is a cat recall? What I want to know is when we actually have a cat, what percentage of the time is the model right? And so uh, since I'm ask, asking about what is actually the case, what I'm really doing is I'm dividing by the sum of numbers in a row, right? Because each row represents what, um, what the data actually is. So in this case, right, so the denominator will be the sum of the row and uh, the numerator will just be a single number, which is cat cat. How many times do we actually call a cat a cat? So in this case, we'll get two over four. Um, and so this is actually one easy way to remember recall versus precision is because recall has an R and row also has an R. Um, if I'm looking at dog recall, okay, so when we actually have a dog, what percentage of the time is the model right? I'm just looking at that top dog row and I'm dividing dog dog by the sum of everything else. And in this case, we always get it right when we see a dog, right? So a four over four, a hundred percent dog recall. Uh, the precision questions are asking something a little bit different. What we're asking here is, say for dog precision, when the model predicts that it's a dog, what percentage of the time is it right? And uh, so when we're kind of looking at all the predictions now, we're talking about columns, right? Because each, each prediction is along a column. So in this case, we're, we're dividing dog dog, top left, by the dog column. We have all the different things we predict and we're gonna get four over six. And then similarly for cat precision, we're dividing cat cat by that cat column. We see that there's perfect precision here. And, and hopefully what you can see is that, um, that they are making different kinds of, of mistakes, right? The, for the cat, uh, we're great on precision, but we have a recall problem. Um, for the dog, it's the opposite. We have perfect recall, uh, but poor, uh, poor precision. And so these kind of two metrics that are, are kind of showing an error, right? Cat recall and dog precision are two ways of looking at that same problem. Uh, sometimes we see a cat and we think it's a dog. The opposite is not true. So I'm not gonna talk about it more here, but I just want uh, to uh, give you some exposure to it. Um, often people try to reduce these numbers down to a single score. Um, for example, there's something popular in machine learning called the F1 score. And, um, and a lot of these kind of sim simple scores are just combinations of these other metrics like precision, um, and, and recall, right? So these are kind of building blocks for other metrics. I'm gonna head over and write some code for this uh, to Jupyter Notebook. 
<clears throat> and um, and in this case, um, I have uh, I have my confusion matrix converted to a data frame, and I'm and I'm showing it down here, uh, like so. Uh, kind of similar to one in the slides, but the numbers are larger now, and I also have a horse. And um, and so the diagonal is good, right? So I can see this is actually not doing too bad, right? I have a lot of large numbers on the diagonal. Um, I see that uh, there's a horse problem. Um, when I see a horse, it actually 90% of the time thinks that's a dog. Um, the other problem I have, right, the other big number that's not on the diagonal is right here. About half of the cats it sees get misclassified as dogs. Okay, that's a problem. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at, I've already produced this confusion matrix. I want to look at things like uh, accuracy score, recall score, precision score, then finally this new metric balance score that I'll introduce. So first, let's take a look at the accuracy score. So I'm going to run accuracy score, and, um, and I need to feed in the actual values and then the predicted values, so I'll do that. The actual and predicted, um, these are the two lists that I use to construct my uh, confusion matrix. And I see that, uh, oh, let me just run this again. And I, and I see that the accuracy is, is 78. Well, it's about 80%, right? So that seems pretty good. And, um, and the key thing to note here, right, is that uh, when we have all these different classes, right, it might seem like we're doing good overall, but there might be cases where we are making a lot of mistakes, right? So for example, when we see a cat, we end up being wrong half of the time. Worse, when we see a horse, we're wrong 90% of the time. And so these other metrics are going to help us dig in and actually identify that. Okay, so uh, let's say I wanted to look at um, uh, recall for the horse, which I'm expecting to be 10%, right? When I see a horse, uh, we only know it 10% of the time. So one way I could do that is I could, um, in my confusion matrix, I could get the horse. Uh, horse value right from that bottom right and um, and I could divide it by the sum of all the values in the horse row right so I could do that and I get 10% just as I expected right uh, the shorter way to do that would be to use um, the this precision score function that's actually built in uh, to sklearn right so I'm going to call this thing and um, and so I have the true values and the predicted values. So I'll say actual predicted. And I actually get an error here. And um, it's complaining about something called multi-class versus binary. Uh, these metrics are kind of set up for the simple cases where our two classes are just false and true, as opposed to four cases like dog, cat, mouse, horse. And so I have to clean that up a little bit. And, um, and the way I'm going to do that is, oh, well, first off, me expand this a little bit. Um, I have to change this average value. Right? So there's different ways to kind of summarize information. And I'm just going to set average to none. And uh, actually, no, it's um, none like that. And then what it's doing is it's actually giving me four recalls, one for each of these classifications. Um, now the order might not be the same as up here. And so I'm actually going to pass in these labels as well um, to make sure that uh, that I can kind of actually compare these numbers to the different values, right? So what I see here is that in terms of, actually I want to do recall first, I'm sorry. I'm going to do recall first. And, um, and so for this recall, right, I'm going row by row. And, uh, and what I see is that recall for the dog is perfect. If I see a dog, the model is going to recognize it as a dog. Um, it's also perfect for mice, right? If it sees a mouse, it's going to recognize it as a mouse. Um, for cats, right, if it sees a cat, 50-50 on whether it will correctly identify it and then for horse, only a 10% chance that it correctly um, identifies it. Okay, those are uh, my four recall numbers. Sometimes what I'll want to do is I'll want to kind of see how I'm doing overall by taking an average of those and I get 65% um, in that case. And um, it turns out there's a special name for this average of recall scores. And that special name is the balanced accuracy score, right? So before this accuracy score was saying, hey, we're doing um, 80 percent uh, but now if I actually do this balanced accuracy score uh, it's only 65 percent much worse and in some ways this is more meaningful the only reason uh, we were very accurate before 
is we were seeing very few horses, right? Even though our model is terrible with horses, we could just a uh, good score because there are not many horses in the, in the in the model, right? So when we're using these balanced metrics, it's trying to take into account for that. It's trying to say even though we have more dogs than um, anything else, really, um, we're going to consider these four classes uh, equally important in terms of coming up with our score. This will be a great one to use if you have a lot of imbalance in your data set, right? And accuracy can be a little bit misleading in that case. Okay, so that was the the recall score. Uh, let me similarly, instead of this, I'm going to actually do the precision, which I guess I was already uh, doing uh, oh, uh, earlier inadvertently. Uh, what happened there? There we go. So I'm going to paste that. And instead of that, I'm going to get this precision score. And, and now I see something different, right? I see that um, I see that actually we do perfect on everything except the dog. And, um, and why is that? So when I'm talking about precision, I'm really going column by column. And what I actually see here is great, right? I uh, Except on the diagonal, I only have zeros in each of these columns. And so that means if this model is predicting a cat, a mouse, or a horse, it's probably right. Only when it's predicting a dog is there a good chance that it's making a mistake, right? In that case, you know, only two thirds chance that it's actually a dog, right? So this model likes to predict dogs a lot. Um, if it predicts something else, it's it's sure. Um, if it predicts a dog, it's only kind uh, of two thirds sure. All right, so that's the uh, we talked about accuracy, uh, recall, balanced accuracy, which is an average of the recalls, and then precision. Uh, one last thing I want to talk about is uh, binary classification. And so for bi binary classifications, instead of cat, dog, mouse, we have just false and true. And, um, and so I'm computing the confusion matrix here for that. And, uh, and if I want to, I can, I can compute these same metrics like I did before. So for example, if I, if I do a recall score down here, <clears throat> I can pass in you know, false and true for my labels. And, um, why is that unhappy? Maybe because I didn't run this yet. There we go. I can run that, and um, and it's telling me okay, row by row, um, in that first row, uh, one third is correct, right? So and in the second one, seventy percent is correct, right? Those are my two recall um, scores. So I can do that just like before, um, but it turns out when we're dealing with binary classification metrics. Um, people will often just talk about uh, predicted, or I'm sorry, they'll just talk about uh, recall and precision without specifying uh, what class they mean. And when they're doing that, what they're talking about is the positive class, right? So if I just talk about recall in general, oh, I don't want that. I'm just trying to talk about uh, recall in general. Look, I'm talking about uh, that positive class. And the same thing for precision. And actually, this is probably the majority of the cases you'll see precision and recall use is kind of in this special case um, where I'm having a binary classifier. So just know that when we're doing that, we're talking about the, the positive class. Hello. In this video, I'm going to be talking about two topics. One is regularization, and the other is standardization. Um, standardization is something that we're going to have to use a lot in this course and understand. Um, and it's really relatively simple. Uh, regularization is a very complicated topic and, and might uh, require a lot of time in a, in a more advanced machine learning course. I'm not trying to get into any math regarding regularization. I'm just going to try to give the kind of simplest intuition, and we aren't going to get deep into it. But I just want you to know that that's an important and, and deeper topic. So in terms of things that we've already done, um, we've been using logistic regression a lot. And a problem that it has that I haven't talked about is that it's very sensitive to scaling. And, um, and so, for example, you might have a data set and uh, there might be some numbers in it with specific units. And you might get one result if you do the classification. If you change those units, so, for example, maybe you change um, miles to feet, you might get a different result, which is, of course, not what we want. We just care about the actual uh, kind of information, not what units somebody arbitrarily chose to use. Um, why is that? Well, it's because logistic regression is applying this technique called regularization, which tries to um, use smaller coefficients and, in general, uh, not have a very large coefficient on just one of our features. 
Um, you, you can imagine that if I have lots and lots of feature columns that just by chance, maybe one of them does better on the training data than others, even if the other feature columns are kind of still somewhat useful. And so what I wouldn't want to do is just by chance, choose that best one because then it won't work well later on a test data set. Uh, regularization uh, basically is providing a motivation to use multiple features and not consider one too heavily, um, even if that would do better in the short term. Um, so logistic regression does this. Linear regression, which was the first model we learned in this course, does not. Uh, but there are also things very similar to linear regression that do, such as ridge regression and lasso regression. We're not going to talk about those in 320, but they're important and used all the time. And so know that this regularization thing is a, is a big deal. Uh, so what would we really like? Uh, we don't want our model to be sensitive to units. We would like to standardize it in some way so that we have the same numbers going in regardless of what the original units were. Um, so for this example, I just made up kind of a fake scenario. Um, we're measuring some sort of quantity in the real world uh, three times. And, uh, and based on that, we're trying to predict what sort of category it's in. And the category will either be true or false. The underlying rule is that when the true length, which we don't know, is bigger than five, then the category is true. If it's less than five, the category is false. And so these three um, kind of noisy measurements, even though they don't tell us exactly what the true length is, they give us some information about that that can help us guess whether it's true or false. So here I have that data, that fake data I'm talking about. The Y column here is um, the category, and then I have my three measurements, X1, X2, and X3. Um, let me just talk a little bit about how I'm generating this. So under numpy.random, there are a bunch of functions that will generate random data. Um, I'm doing a normal distribution here. Um, you can sample from different distributions. If you don't know what that means, um, that's fine for this course. But basically, I'm generating a 1,000 random numbers with an average of four and uh, putting them in here. Uh, and so this will be an array of numbers. And then I'm saying, well, whenever that's five, greater than five, I want to have a true, otherwise I'll have a false. When I'm looking at this data frame down here, true feet does not directly go into any of these um, and then into any of these columns, it's unknown. But category does, and category is what we're trying to predict. So how are we going to try to predict if we don't know true feet? Well, I have these three other columns, which are basically just true feet uh, plus some random noise. So if I look at it down here, let me look at this first one. All three measurements were less than five. So it makes a lot of sense that I'll predict that uh, the Y is less than, than five. Um, maybe I can uh, uh, even look at some more cases here. I wonder if um, uh, I can see where it's true. Let me do that. So I can see some other cases here where it's true, right? All In this case, all the measurements were greater than five. Uh, so I say it's true. This is kind of a more interesting example. Um, this number is very large, right? One measurement was like almost seven. And even though the other two measurements were less than five, uh, this was enough of a signal that uh, the model decided it's true. Uh, well, it's true overall. And, and so hopefully the model will decide the same. Okay, so that's the data we're working with. And let's see if we can um, uh, train a model to try to uh, predict this. So I'm gonna create a model and I'm gonna use a linear or logistic regression model. And uh, I'm gonna fit it to my data. And so I'm gonna have some X and some Ys. For my Ys, I'm just gonna pull that Y column from my training data. And for my X, I wanna pass in a list of all my um, columns that contain features, so X1, X2, and X3. And, um, and I'm gonna be using these again, so I'm actually just gonna put this in a variable called X columns, and then I don't have to keep typing that whole long thing every time. And so I fit it, and that's great. And so pretty soon I'm gonna look at the coefficients for this model, but before that I just wanna, um, as an aside, see what accuracy it has. If I wanna see the accuracy of a model, um, I can just say, instead of fit, I wanna score. And then to be realistic, I should um, score it on data that I haven't seen before instead of the thing I trained it on. Right, so this is kind of a better test. And I see that it has 89% uh, accuracy. Uh, is that good? 89% seems high that we would be right that often. But let me show you why it's not necessarily. If I look at this Y column, I see it's almost always false. And indeed, if I say value counts, I can see it's only true um, less than 20% of the time. And I can actually just divide this by the length of test to see that. And so what this means is that even if I had a very naive model that just always has false, I would be getting 81% accuracy. 89% is better, but in that context, it's not so amazing um, just given that there's so much skew in that column.
Okay, so after I look at the um, accuracy of a model, the next thing I'll often want to look at are my coefficients, and I like to plot those in some way. Oh, my uh, model coefficients. And I see those are right here, and um, and I'd like to have some sort of bar plot. So I know that these things are paired up with these x columns, right? So this is the coefficient uh, for x1, so on and so forth. And so I, the way I'll often make such a bar plot is I'll say pd.series, and then I will have my uh, y values, and then I'll have index equals x values dot plot dot bar. So on uh, the x values, I'm going to use those column names, and then I'm going to put the coefficients uh, to basically have the quantities that are going to go to the y-axis. And it's complaining that the length of one of these things is, is, is um, 1 when it was supposed to be 3. And so uh, x columns, that's pretty simple there. But if I look at this, uh, this array right here, what do I see? I see there's um, it's really a two-dimensional thing. Uh, I can flatten it into a one-dimensional array with three numbers. Or if I say negative 1, it'll make it one-dimensional, but it'll make it um, you know, it'll, it doesn't matter how many numbers I have, it'll figure it out. So I'm going to put that here now, and now I get this plot. And this is interesting, right? I was talking about how maybe sometimes um, just by chance we focus more on one column than another, and that happened here, right? Uh, x1, x2, and x3 were all equally noisy, but it just so happens that um, based on the training data, the model thinks that x1 is, is more um, kind of more uh, useful, right? That was just by chance. Right? And so you can imagine a worse scenario where it picks one column that it really likes and ignores all these other ones that have good information in it. And so the model will try to avoid doing that. Regularization means that we'll try not to put too much weight on just one uh, factor. We'll try to spread it out a little bit. And, um, and, and then if you took it to an extreme, you might imagine that uh, I could have a model where I just um, look at my intercept. Right, my intercept is, uh, you can imagine that being like the average and the model could just predict that and all my coefficients could be zero. Um, in that case, well, we always just predict the same thing. Um, and we want to have this, um, this problem, I guess we'd have another problem that just wouldn't be very accurate. Okay, so I have that. And so let me head back here and I'm going to re-randomly generate this data. But this time I'm just going to change the units on, on this column. And I'm going to change the units to be miles. And so there's 5,280 uh, feet in a mile. So I'm just making a comment here. This is um, feet to uh, miles like that. And so I have the same kind of data, uh, just different units. So I might hope that my model won't do anything that differently. And so I'm going to run this again. And I see that not too much has changed here. And then I want to think about what's going to happen when I rerun this. So in this x2 column, um, the, the numbers are all much smaller now. Uh, because it's in miles. Um, and so I might expect that to use this, I might have a bigger coefficient on x2 if I wanted it to be just like before. It turns out when I run it, I actually see the opposite. Um, it's adverse to having such large coefficients on one column uh, because of that regularization thing I talked about. So it actually decides, hey, I'm just going to ignore um, x2 entirely. I have to put a bigger or a bigger weight on that than I'm comfortable doing have it be a factor. So I, I just lost some information there. So I'm not using these two columns anymore. Now, of course, that's silly, right? Uh, putting a bigger coefficient on it isn't really weighting it more. It's just canceling out the fact that I have different units on it. And so there's different ways to solve this. One is that I could just um, insist that I have the same units for everything. Other way I could do it is I could try to um, kind of make this a little more uniform in some way. And so that's what I'm going to do here. Um, I'm going to head back here and uh, let me... Um, let me take my training data and my, um, actually, where do I want to do this? I take these X columns even sooner. Uh, actually, no, that's fine. I'm going to leave that there. So I'm going to take my training data and um, I want to take a slice of it and I want to get all the rows and I want to get columns X1 through uh, X2. And so this is just my features now. Oh, through X3. Sorry. These are just my features. And I want to have somehow um, standardize it so that uh, they all have roughly the same scale. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pull this out into uh, this x uh, variable right here. And, um, and there's going to be two things I'm going to do. One is that I'm going to take the mean of each, uh, of each column, just like that. And I'm going to subtract these numbers off of each column. So I'm going to say that. And so now all of these columns are centered at zero, right? After I subtract away the mean, 
the average of every column is zero. It turns out that uh, that is also helpful for logistic regression to run faster. I'm not trying to get into de details about why. That's useful. And then more importantly, I want them to be on the same scale. And so, oops, what happened there? Um, I jumped onto a new column or to a new cell. Um, and so if I look at this, that's a standard deviation of each column. And, and, and if I have larger numbers, well, the standard deviation will be higher. And so standardization, the real key part is that I'm dividing all of this by that standard deviation. And if I do that, I may get a bunch of small numbers that have roughly the same scale. So after I've done this, all of them will have the same average, zero, and then the same standard deviation of one. And so this would be a better um, X data. And I can actually put this back in to my training data like this. So I'm going to say this equals my new X data. So I make a note here, I'm going to say manually standardize the data. And so after I do that, I run all of this stuff again. And now I see that, um, great, uh, X2 is back in play, even though I have different units. It's not getting obsessed with these other columns uh, just based on the units. So this was a good thing to do, okay? That's what standardization is. Now, it turns out that, um, that to do this right, I have to calculate this mean and standard de deviation on the training data, but then I have to use that same mean and uh, standard deviation on the test data. I can't retake the mean on the test data. And so the methodolog methodology of this gets a little bit complicated. And so generally we won't do this. Generally we'll have um, sklearn uh, do that for us. And, and so it turns out that there's a, a, um, a pre-processing step called standardization, and we're gonna use that instead of manually doing this. So I'm gonna head back here, and uh, you can see I've already imported my standard scalar. And so I'm gonna run this here, and this is skipping now. Um, for my model, right, I'll just actually leave this for now and that'll be my bad model. What I'll do is I'll, I'll create a new model, which will be a pipeline model. And in that pipeline model, I wanna have a standard scalar followed by a logistic regression, just like that. And this one, so I may have to actually create them like that. Um, I have to give them names, right? So I'm gonna, uh, Past tuples here, so I'm gonna call that a uh, standard scalar. Okay, I have to put Thomas to separate these things. And then uh, and then maybe I'll call this logistic regression, uh, like that. And so this is my new model. And then it turns out all this stuff I was doing before of like fitting, for example, uh, it can work the same way, right? I can fit just like I did before because I called this new one also fit. And so I can do that. I could also score it like I did before. Um, let me score it now. And I get something very similar. And then what's going to be interesting is that when I actually do this, when I actually try to get this bar plot, um, it should show that it's back in play, right? Even though uh, the non-standardized version is ignoring X2 now, this version should show it. So I'm going to run this, and there's going to be a small error here. And the problem is that pipeline doesn't have coefficients, right? This pipeline as a whole uh, doesn't have coefficients, but the logistic regression inside of it does have coefficients. And so how can I get to that? It turns out that any um, pipeline works like a dictionary. And I can, um, I can, for example, I can copy these names and use that like a key. And so that would get me my standard scalar from the beginning. Or I could pass in this key, and that would get me a logistic, um, uh, my logistic regression stage of it. And so from that, then I could actually see, well, what are the coefficients involved there? And I would, um, um, I would paste this here instead of what I originally had. And so now I can see that when I have the standardization in play as a transformer before my estimator, it'll automatically do that and, and then it'll do the right things as well. If I do my fitting here, it'll calculate that mean and the standard deviation. When I do scoring, it's just going to use the same uh, mean and standard deviation from before. It would not look at that for the test because that would be kind of a methodological um, mistake. So we're going to be generally doing this uh, whenever we have a logistic regression, unless we have some very special scenario. Um, for example, that uh, the data has already been standardized. So we've been doing a lot of um, supervised learning lately. Uh, in particular, we've been doing uh, regression and classification. Uh, now I'm going to give an example of an unsupervised learning problem, uh, which is clustering. And, um, and clustering might feel like it has some similarities to uh, classification. 
Um, in classification, sometimes I would show these scatter pot plots where there's different kinds of points. And we were, uh, you know, those points were labeled, right? Maybe there's some red points and some blue points, whatever. And uh, we were trying to find boundaries or rules to separate the different kinds of, of data points that we had. And we did that based on some predetermined labels that came with the data. We know which kind of point is which. Um, in clustering, we might similarly have some sort of scatter of data or the multidimensional um, equivalent of that. Uh, but the difference is, is that there's no um, pre-existing labels on the data. That's what makes this an unsupervised learning problem. Um, the algorithm itself gets to choose the labels. And, um, and so there's you know, a million different ways you could choose to apply labels to an existing data set. Uh, but we still have some uh, constraints, or maybe I should say like a goal. Um, our goal is to choose those labels so that we're kind of grouping similar data uh, together. And there's ways to measure that. So clustering is this general problem. There's lots of different clustering algorithms. Uh, by far the most famous is k-means, so that's where I'm going to start. Um, and so I'm doing some imports here. Eventually I'm going to be using the k-means that comes with sklearn. Uh, but to help you understand how the algorithm works, I'm actually just going to write the code from scratch um, in this video before we actually start using this one. Um, so in sklearn, there's this data set submodule that can uh, make blobs, or, or these blobs are basically clusters. Um, you tell them how many points you want, um, how many kind of different centers they cluster around, and then something about standard deviation. And, um, and, and that returns two things. It returns x, which is actually two columns, um, an x0 and an x1, and then a y, which is indicating um, uh, what cluster or blob each of these points was part of, right? And so I don't really care about why, I'm just going to throw that away. Uh, but I'm going to throw out those two x values in here, and then I have this data frame uh, just like here. And so what we're going to be working towards is trying to find, um, are there clusters of different points in here uh, where it's kind of centered around something? And um, and so let me, let me scroll down a little bit before I look at this code. And so here's a picture of those points that got generated. Um, you can see it's pretty random, although they kind of I have center around three different points. I'm, I'm just putting a question mark here for now uh, because these are unlabeled, right? There's no real category. I just have these two um, x0 along the x-axis and, and x1 along the y-axis uh, for my coordinates. And um, and so ultimately to do this, I have, uh, you know, I'm doing a data frame dot plot dot scatter like we've done lots of times before. Um, the reason why I'm writing this special uh, function here, uh, km scatter, um, KN stands for K means. I'll talk a little bit more about why we have that name. Um, is that I'm going to be wanting to show um, different symbols for different points. And there's not an easy way to specify a column that gives the type of symbol. right? So we have to loop over that. And uh, that's going to be determined by uh, this column called label, if there is one, right? Not necessarily, right? And, um, and so this is automatically going to be plotting well, I just have the comment here. Right? It's going to be plotting x0 along the x-axis and, uh, and so on and so forth. Right? So I'm going to be using this as I go forward. All right, so you can probably already see there's three clusters here. And well, we actually know that because we randomly generated the data. Uh, but how can we find um, kind of good uh, indicators for where those are? And those indications are going to be called centroids. We're going to ultimately try to say, well, here's the center of these three clusters. Uh, that we that we discovered, right? So how can we do that automatically? And, um, and so that's a hard problem, trying to find the three best uh, points. An easier problem uh, in general, right, than finding the best answer is to just take a bad answer and make it slightly better. Um, if you know how to do that and you can repeat it, well, that often ends up uh, giving us a pretty good answer in the end. And this is a strategy that we used for gradient descent. Um, it's very pervasive um, in learning. And, um, and it's the strategy we're going to use now for the k, k means, right? So we're going to take a bad answer, um, and the bad answer looks like this. I'm just going to randomly choose some starting points and assign them each a, a different symbol. And uh, for now, I'm just going to assume that I'm going to have three points, three clusters here. We'll eventually revisit that assumption. And I'm going to scatter it down here. And, and so you can see that this is where it thinks those three clusters are. And of course, uh, that's horrible, right? That's not where the three... Uh, clusters are. So how can we automatically um, identify the centers of those three clusters? And so the strategy that we're going to use is uh, we're going to alternate between doing two things. Um, 
first, we're going to do something called assignment, which is taking each of these points and, um, and putting it in the cluster, just saying it's going to be in the cluster uh, with the centroid that's nearest to it, right? So these three things are centroids. Uh, uh, centroid is kind of a, a two-dimensional mean, right? So it's the average x0 and the average uh, x1, right? So those are the centroids. And, and, and so the k-means, that's the name of this algorithm, right? So in this case, k is just a variable. And so really we have three means or three centroids, right? We want to find the best location of those. So, so like I was saying, we're going to assign each of these points to the centroid that's closest to it. And, um, and that's a point assignment. And then the other step we're going to do is we're going to update where these centroids are so that they get closer to the values that are assigned to them. And we keep alternating back and forth between um, deciding which uh, which points go with which centroid and then where the centroids are. And eventually it, it should hopefully converge and, and try to discover these three points. And so to do this, I'm going to be building a, a new class, right? And um, I'm just going to call my class KM. And, uh, and I'm going to have an init method. And uh, <clears throat> maybe what I'm going to do is um, uh, pass in the data frame uh, with all my data. And, um, and then people, in a lot of these uh, implementations, they would specify something like, well, how many clusters are there? Um, for simplicity, I have already created this data frame um, of, of clusters right here, which if I, if I look at that, what do I have for my clusters? I, I already have the data for these um, three points, right? I kind of did that. And so I'm just going to keep that outside of my class for now, uh, just to keep the code a little bit cleaner. And, uh, and so I'm going to grab these things, right? So I'm going to say that self.clusters equals clusters. And, um, and I'm going to be making a lot of changes to these things. And I don't want to change the original data. So I'm going to make copies of these data frames, uh, just like so. And maybe let's just uh, see that we actually have um, something here. I'm just curious what is in this uh, label, right? So I'm going to say uh, self.labels uh, equals self.clusters. And I want to look at that label column. But just like that, and maybe I'll just convert that to a uh, to a list, like so, and then I may print that self dot labels. Okay, so I want to create one of these things dot km, and uh, and I need to pass in my data frame with all my points, and then my and then my clusters. Right, and I do that, and um, and well, what am I actually doing there? That was a little silly of me. Uh, I want to save that in that variable. And cool, those are my three clusters. I'm just choosing cluster names that happen uh, to be symbols, right? So I can easily plot these. Typically, people would just kind of arbitrarily call these clusters one, two, and three. Remember, there's not any label in the original data. The original data looks like looks like this thing, right? Where I have 100 rows. And then my clusters actually kind of look similar, right? I have the x, two x values specifying the center, and then also the label. Okay, so one of the first things I'm going to want to do is I'm going to want to be able to plot this uh, as we go uh, because we're going to be making changes, right? So I want to grab this code that I had before uh, to just see what's going on. Uh, just like so. And I'm going to plot that. And uh, let me see here. I, I guess uh, I can't just use data frame and clusters because these are attributes now. And I don't want those versions. So I'm going to say self.df and, um, and self.clusters. And uh, there we go, right? In our kind of initial state of the system that we want to uh, want to make better. And so remember, there's these two phases that I, I talked about. We're going to have um, something where we assign the points. Right? So that's going to be one step we're going to do. And, and, and what we're doing here is we're really um, kind of uh, drawing from clusters to points, right? Based on where our cluster, uh, maybe I should tell them centroids are, where our centroids are, um, that's going to affect, well, what happens in our points. We're going to assign each point to a centroid. I'm going to have that. And, um, and another thing I'm going to have is um, update, update the centers, right? And I'm just going to, by alternating calling this and this and then this and then this, we're ultimately going to end up with a good solution um, to this problem. Okay, so first off, how do I uh, do the centroid assignment? That's maybe the harder one. This, this function here is maybe a little bit easier. 
And, um, and, and so, well, what I want to do here, right, is I want for each of these points, I want to assign it to uh, one of the clusters, okay? And, um, and it needs to be the closest one. So maybe the first thing I'm going to do is, here, let me just do this, km.dataframe. I'm going to add some columns here, right? And this is one of the reasons why I copied that data frame when I started. I'm going to add a column for each cluster that specifies how close this point is uh, to that cluster. And, um, and then once I've added those three columns, then I'll add a, yet another column that says, well, what, um, which, which one is closest? Which one do I actually want to be in? Okay, so I'm going to do something like this. I'm going to say, um, I'm going to loop over all the, all the clusters, right? So, or I guess the labels. And, um, and so I'm going to say for cluster and, well, I'm going to loop over this thing. <clears throat> Like so, maybe let me just um, print this. And and the way I want to loop over it is I'm going to do uh, enter uh, tuples. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and this is going to give me named tuples, right? So let me let me do this. Kn dot assign points. And maybe looping over these named tuples. And so I know where the center of each of these things are. Okay. And, um, and so now I want to update, right? I'm updating my points in my data frame. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at these columns, right? I'm gonna say X zero. And I wanna compute for each row here, <coughs> the, the, the distance between that along the X zero axis and that center, right? So I'm gonna take that minus X zero. And, um, and I'm going to save that as x0 diff. And, uh, and then I'm going to do the same thing along the other dimension. And, um, and then what I ultimately want to do, oh, let me, my apologies. What I ultimately want to do is I want to compute the, the distance between, um, between these points and the center of the cluster, right? So I, I have, I have the differences along these two dimensions. So the distance, um, is going to be like this. It's going to be x0 diff squared plus x1 diff squared. And then I'm taking the square root of all that. That's just the Euclidean distance. 0 0.5 to take the square root. And, um, and, and let me think here. So this is an individual number, right? I'm looping, so, but each, for each pass through loop, it's an individual number. This is a whole column. So this is a column. This is a column. Really, I'm computing all the distances at once, okay? And so I'm going to say self.df, and um, let me come back to this. This is going to be those distances. I'm adding that new column. And, and what I'm going to use for this column name is the cluster that I'm currently in. Okay, so I'm just going to put cluster here. And so, so now if I run this, uh, I'm not printing anything right now. You know what? Let me just clean up this too. I don't need that anymore. Or better yet, just uh, delete it, right? And let me look at what happens to the data frame after I run that. Um, something horrible, which is, well, it's adding these weird things, which what I really wanted to do was, was to be the cluster name. Let me do that. And now this is great, right? I can see that, um, you know, my x0, my x1, and that's a point, right? And I can say, well, how far is that from the O cluster? How far is it from the plus cluster? How far is it from the x cluster? And it's closest to the O cluster, so that's ultimately what I want to um, uh, want this one to be in, right? So what I'm going to do, right, is after I've looped and I've computed these uh, three columns, is I'm going to say self dot data frame and label. I want it to be one of these three. You know what? Let me, let me just try to poke around down here first to see how I can get to that. Um, what, what I really want to look at is I want to look at. Um, I want to look at those three columns there and figure out, well, which of these columns has the smallest value in each case? And, um, and it turns out that there is a pandas function that does that very easily, and it's called uh, index n, right? And, and normally what that's doing, right, is it's going column by column and telling me, oh, the smallest value in the O column is at position 11, the smallest value in the plus column is at position 78, not, not quite what I want, right? I want it to go horizontally, right? So I want to find out, well, which 
you know, instead of looking at these index values over here on the right, I really want to look at the column column index here instead and say, well, which of these, which column gives me the smallest? And so I'm going to paste this back. And instead of saying axis equals zero, I'm going to say axis, you know, that's vertical. I'm going to say axis equal one, which is horizontal. And then I can get all of these classes, right? So I'm going to put this back up in here. And, um, and I'm going to run this again, right? So look at my data frame. I run that and I can see, okay, great. So I have my original data, which never changes by the way, right? The data never changes. Then I compute the distance to each of these clusters. And then based on that, I'm like, okay, well, this first one, O is the smallest number. So that's an O cluster. Uh, same thing for the second one. The third one, the smallest value of these three is under the X columns. So that's in the X cluster. So I've been able to assign all of these um, points and um, and so let me just show you what's going to happen, right? Let me run this again. So here are the points. If I do the assignments of points, you're going to see that instead of question marks, it's uh, saying what each of these are, right? So so you see that this um, circular cluster is really big. It's actually kind of capturing uh, most of these. And then this one is kind of has the opposite problem. We have one actual cluster, and it's being shared between the plus points and the the x points over here right but but it is some clustering and um and now that we've actually kind of started with a bad answer we can make it we can make it better and the way i'd like to make it better is that now that i've kind of decided well which points are in the circle cluster i can uh kind of find where that circle cluster is right i can see that um at this red circle here that's not a very good real center because that's way to the right of all the points that it's representing right and so that one's going to be a little bit easier now. We're actually going to update these center points. Okay. Let me, before I do that, though, let me do one other thing. Uh, sometimes, notice how I'm kind of calling this one and I'm calling this one. And each time I say KM, KM, KM. When, um, when people don't have to return anything from their functions, right? I don't return anything here. Uh, what people will often do, right? Sometimes you'll see this, is they'll just return self. Right, and, and the advantage of that is when I call this, it does some stuff, and then it returns km. And because it's returning km, I can just try to chain this along like that. Right, so that's one reason you often see people just returning self in a method. And, and so ultimately, we're going to be doing the same thing down here, right? But let's actually update these centers, and um, and try to do something. And uh, and the easiest way to do this is with a group by. Right, I want to. If I, if I go back here, let me let me do this. I look at that data frame again. Um, ultimately, what I want to do is I want to find the new um, centroids, which are kind of the average of these columns for each label. And um, and so the way I can do that is I can say group by label. That gives me this weird. Let, let me just stop plotting for a moment. That gives me this weird data group by um, object. And uh, but then what I can do is I can I can compute the means on it, just like so. So this when I do a group by right, that's when I go to the index, right over here on the left. And I'm kind of getting the mean over all these other columns. And, and you know what? There's too much stuff there, right? Because uh, when I'm computing centroids, I don't really care about the averages of these anymore. So I'm just going to do this. I say I just want my um, uh, my x columns. Right, and then the last thing that's a little bit weird is um, you noticed before, like when I started, um, label was just a regular column. Uh, the group by uh, made it not a column; it made it um, an index. Uh, but I didn't really want that, so I'm just going to do a reset index here. Right. So this little line here, right, this one line, is a quick way to compute what I'd like the new clusters to be. You see, it has all the same data as before label x0 and x1 right but but now instead of you know my data started off randomly right uh horrible right now i'm actually having some sort of uh, meaning to it right i'm actually saying well um let's put our clusters at the center or our centroids at the center of of the cluster of data that they're representing right so this one's going to be very simple right they self my clusters equals that and um Maybe let me just um, 
I'm going to split this off, right? So I'm just going to say clusters equals that. And self.clusters equals. Right, so, so the first step is I'm just getting the mean or the centers, right, of each each label. And then I'm just kind of pulling out the columns I want and fixing it up so it's in the original original shape, right? Okay. Let me do this. I haven't called it yet, right? I just called the one we did before. That's the one we usually start with. Um, but now I can, can do this, right? After I've assigned those points, now I can run the other function and make it better, right? So maybe let me actually do this. I'm going to just plot it here. am.plot. But let me just look at the original. So the first off, I don't know anything, right? It's just everything's random. Then I do an assign points. Yeah, that's good. And then after assigning the points, then I want to do what? I want to um, uh, update the centers. And, uh, let, let me just do a quick experiment. I wonder if I can just even put this together in this one. That's trying to make my life a little easier. Great, I can see those two things, right? So. Um, Right, so the data started looking like this. I'm going to up, assign the points to a cluster and then update the cluster centroids, right? So here I update the points. And uh, and then you can see, wait a minute, what happened here? Let me just try to start. I, I ran it twice, I'm sorry. Um, all right, so you can see the first thing it did, right, is it assigned the points and then it moved it over. You can kind of see that, you know, this first one's assigning the points, the second one's updating the centroids. You can see that, um, a couple of things happened, right? Like this, this red circle moved to the left to be closer to um, where it's supposed to be. Um, and then this plus is kind of encroaching in. There's no reason for it to be hanging so far out. And so if I run these two steps again, like this, it's trying to get even, even better, right? So I'm going to run that again. And, um, and now what you see, right, is not, not much happened. Uh, not much happened. Well, the red points that move originally, right? And not much happened over here on the left, but but you see what happened down here, right? This plus sign kind of grabbed some more points after it moved in, and so since it's grabbing those points, X's remaining points are kind of have a great center of gravity more to the left, right? So when I update again, I'm kind of bumping that X a little bit more to the left, right? And if I keep running this. Right, it should keep bumping it farther and farther over. Right, if I keep uh, updating this, it might take a, a few times. I don't know why it got stuck there. There we go. And um, and so you can kind of actually see I run into a problem here, and um, and the problem is that. I've hit a local minimum, right? I can I can clearly see that it will be better if this red point, this red circle, bumps up here to the top, and then this X kind of grabs the cluster down here, but it's not doing that because it basically has to get worse before it gets better, right? So it kind of um, hit what we might call a local minimum. And so, well, how do I solve that? It turns out there's not a bug in my code. I got unlucky, and I wasn't anticipating this will happen, but it's a nice opportunity to talk about it. And uh, I got unlucky because of where uh, where these starting clusters were, right? I kind of randomly decided where those starting clusters were, and they happened to be a point where it didn't kind of gravitate towards um, the three actual um, clusters. And it turns out that this is a problem in every implementation. If I go to the, the real one, um, it will have this thing here, which is the number of times we should try running the algorithm. And... Um, and each time, right, it kind of starts off with different uh, starting points and then randomly updates it in the hope that it, it converges, right? And so then it'll take the best of those. And so I wasn't anticipating that it happening during this demo, right, because it didn't happen when I practiced before, uh, but I'm going to redo it now. So I'm going to leave my data alone, right? I'm going to see what happens when I come up, when I kind of re-randomly generate my starting points. So I'm going to start with these as my three starting points now. And remember the default, right? When we're eventually using sklearn, is we're going to start over ten different times and see what happens each time. Now, when I run this, let me. You know what? Let me. I don't want to have any old plots that are confusing, confusing things. I'm going to do this. I'm going to say so that's my starting point. I'm going to say km 
dot assign points dot plot. That was what it was called, right? Assign points. And then update, second step, update centers, right? So I'm going to do that. And okay, I can see that I've assigned the points and then updated the centers. And now, now I can see I got luckier this time and uh, it's not perfect, right? I can see that at this point, there's still some weirdness, right? That this one is reassigned over here. But if I keep even just a couple passes, it actually quickly finds out where the three clusters are, right? And, and usually it'll be somewhere in between there. Maybe it takes a few times to actually uh, converge on, on the right thing. Okay. In the last video, we, uh, we built our own k-means class. Um, in this one, we're going to be learning about how the one that comes with sklearn works. And usually you'll want to do that because it works, um, it kind of gets all these uh, tricky details right. Um, for example, um, you can easily have it automatically generate varying numbers of starting clusters. Uh, it will often have strategies that are smarter than pure randomness for choosing the positions of those uh, before it runs the algorithm. Um, it generally uh, has some uh, logic around when it has been updating the centers enough and it's not going to get any better. And so you can set an upper cap on that, but it's not going to do it more than necessary um, in general. So overall, you're going to want to use k-means uh, that comes with sklearn rather than rolling your own. Um, so the, the k-means actually has these three uh, methods with it that we need to know. We have fit, which is not surprising, right? We've seen fit for both transformers and estimators. Um, what's a little bit strange about it is that it has both transform, uh, like you might expect for a transformer, and predict, like you might expect for an estimator. So, so k-means has some similarities with both um, uh, transformers and estimators, even though um, estimators uh, and prediction is a little bit, uh, it's kind of a strange use of it, right? Because we aren't predicting some label that was given to us. We're both coming up with the labels and predicting them. Um, at the same time, so it's not really a classic prediction. So I'm going to just uh, show some rough code or, or kind of data to demonstrate what these three are doing in the context of the code we wrote before, before we actually dive into um, using um, a means. So before in our class, we saw that we had these assign points and update center, and that was the real core of what we needed to do. And um, a fit method, what it'll probably be doing is some sort of loop like this for i and range of something. It's just going to be calling both of those. It'll call the sign points, and it will call the update centers, and it'll do that a bunch of times um, to try to find the, the right answer. And how many times is that? Well, uh, we're going to call that number of times it does that, the number of epochs, right? And so I'm going to say epochs here. And, and like I was saying, right, in the actual k-means that comes with sklearn, uh, this will be an upper bound, right? If it sees that this is not improving anything further, uh, it might have some uh, break that happens if it's already done. If not getting any better. I'm not going to do that. I'm just trying to write kind of rough code to give you an idea of what's happening. And so when we do this, right, on our version, I plot this at the end, hopefully, Hopefully it's solving this and kind of updating those points. And indeed it is, right? It's kind of figuring out where um, each of those centroids should go. So that's the fit method. Now in, in the process of doing this, we um, created a lot of supplemental information for our original data frame, right? So this was our original data frame that just has some points. And in contrast to that, we have this data frame that the k-means class was using with some extra information. Uh, first, we have the distance to each of the clusters. And, um, and so that can be useful information in and of itself. Uh, but looking at those three distances, we can figure out which number is smallest. In this case, the number in the x column is smallest. So this is going to be, uh, this row is going to be in the x cluster. Right? And this next one, uh, the o number is smallest. So we're going to be in the o cluster. And so, when we're looking at, let me actually just shorten this up a bit. When we're looking at uh, using k-means for either transformation or prediction, the only difference is whether we're using these distances or the labels. And so let me do the transformation first or just show you what we'll get there. We'll be effectively getting this data. 
<coughs> that's what we'll get out when we do a transformation in k-means and i'll eventually talk about how that's useful as a pre-processing step before we do something like logistic regression uh, and then for prediction all we're really getting is well uh, what group does it fit nicely into and, and again right this is not really like classic prediction because we're both deciding what the labels are and deciding which points go with each label okay i'm going to use k-means on this same data uh, from k-means from sk learn this time instead of our own and so i'm going to say km equals k-means and there's a bunch of configuration options here <coughs> for example how many clusters we want to start with um, i'm going to say uh, we would like to start with three of them and uh and then what we can say km dot fit we always have to do a fit regardless of whether we're going to do a transformation or prediction next and i want to fit to that data frame so let me just look at that one more time data frame dot head so i want to fit that data and we do and uh, and once we do that then we can do either of those things we could say transform and um there might be some cases where this is a kind of a training data and then we're trying to um, apply our clusters or force our clusters on some you know second data frame and maybe some test data um, and it'll be very common though that we want to do it to the same original data and so when i'm doing this transformation here i saw well i have three clusters and that's why i'm doing three columns of numbers here right the three distances for uh, e each row in my original data set and um, it is very common, right? Rather than doing fit and then transform, you know, why not do both at once, uh, just like so? Um, that would be a fine thing to do. The same way I can also do a fit predict, and then instead of saying, well, which group is it in? It's trying to tell me specifically, oh, you're in group zero, you're in group two, so on and so forth. And, um, and so something we might wanna do, right, is that I might want to create a copy of my original data frame and then add this prediction in and i'm going to say uh well, what am i going to say i'm going to call that cluster right i could call it a you know, classification something like that and um let me actually look at this now right i can see well these are the clusters that it's predicted to be in maybe i'll look at the tail to see some others right and um and so i could plot it and i could assign different colors to the different clusters if I wanted to, right? I could say dot, uh, dot scatter, uh, x equals x0, y equals x1, right? We're having x along both dimensions. You get those three things. But I'd really like to see what color they are. So I'm gonna pass in a color equals data frame two of what cluster you are. And, um, and you notice one of these vanishes, so zero ends up being white. And so what I should do is I should pass in a different color map. And so let me head over here and look at the different color maps in matplotlib. Um, cluster zero is not more similar to cluster one than it is to cluster two, right? So I don't really care about getting what is called a sequential um, color map, something like that, where it's kind of on this spectrum. Um, really, zero, one, and two are just different categories for me. So I'm going to be looking into the qualitative color maps, and, um, and I'm just going to go with this one here. Because it's a nice set of colors, and I'm not going to have more than 10 clusters. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to say I want the tab 10 color map. And now I can see it's actually giving me those different colors, those different uh, groups of points. Um, if I wanted to, I could also um, look at the centroids and draw that on top of here. And I get the centroids like so. I can say data, I'm sorry, k means dot cluster centers. And, um, and what am I getting here? Well, the, the coordinates of each centroid are like a row here. And I have three centroids, and that's why I have three rows. And so I could absolutely wrap that up in a data frame and i could plot it right i could um say dot plot dot scatter and i could say well the x is x zero oh x is zero y is one 
and uh, and I could plot those three points and um, and let me just make them larger and uh, red right so I'm gonna say color equals red size equals 100 actually use s here and, and I should really combine this with what I had before I can actually see the centroids and um, and to really make it work I have to say that it should use the same region right so um you know let me just split this up here right it's getting too long centroid stop plot dot scatter same ax <clears throat> and so I and I, I can do all that same stuff just like I did with our, with our own version um version before okay let me address an issue, which is how did I know that we should use three clusters? And well, the answer here is that I just kind of eyeballed it. Uh, what if there's like 20 clusters, right? That might not be so easy to do. Or um, what if instead of having nice two dimensional data, I have x0, x1, x2, x3, x4, x5. It won't be obvious before and how many clusters there are. And so the strategy that you'll do is you'll try a different number of clusters and see how well it does. And this measure of how well it does is, is called inertia. And so I can look at inertia uh, in our data like this. And well, what is this measuring? It's measuring the average squared distance from points to nearest centroid. That's what that means, right? So, so for example, um, this one over here is actually kind of far from that centroid, right? So that'll contribute a lot uh, to this score. Um, whereas this one right here is really close to a centroid, right? So so hopefully everything's kind of neatly around a centroid. And of course, the more um, the more centroids I have, uh, this number will go down. This inertia number will go down, right? Lower is better. Right? It means well, no, the number means everything's near a centroid. And so what we'll do is we'll actually try different numbers of clusters and see how quickly. Uh, inertia drops off. So, so let's do this. So I'm going to go back and kind of grab all of this stuff I had before. And, um, and so I'm going to grab this. And, and actually, let, let, me, let me do this. This is what I really need. I am going to have a little loop like this. And I, I don't even care about making the predictions anymore. I just want to know that inertia score. Uh, I'm going to say inertia. Oh, your score. Okay, and so you can see what I'm going to do here. Right? I'm going to try different amounts, and of course, as I add more of these things, the inertia goes down until, well, if I have the same number of clusters and points, then uh, luckily each point hits its own cluster. So I'm going to have a loop here. I'm going to say 4k in range, and I want to have 1 to 10 clusters, right? So k, that's why it's k means. Uh, k is the number of centroids and mean. First, the fact that a centroid is kind of the average of all their x, y values. I run this thing, and um, and I want to put all of these in a in a dictionary, or, or better than a dictionary, even a series, right? So I'm going to say uh, scores equals a series, and um, and so I'm going to do it like this. I'm going to say scores of k equals this thing, this this inertia. I'm going to try running this, and when I'm all done, or I think there's maybe some issues here still. Um, one of the issues that's actually relatively new in Pandas is that they don't like you to leave it ambiguous what the type is going to be. So I may be very explicit up front. This series is going to have floats. And then the other thing it's complaining about is, well, I have a key error of one. And, and the reason why I have that is because when I just put brackets after a series, uh, it's guessing whether this is an index or an integer position. And now it's guessing incorrectly that it's an integer position, right? So it's guessing this, which of course doesn't work. If I change it to that, uh, voila, I can, I can get my scores. And once I have my scores, of course, I can plot my scores uh, like so. And, um, and, and I should also do this. I should say, I should say that, uh, put some labels here. Well, x label is k, which is the number of clusters. And my y label 
is what? My y label is the average squared distance to your nearest um your nearest uh centroid, right? And um and, and so when I'm looking at this here, I see that having two centroids is much better than having one. So there's two very clear clusters. Um, going from two to three, another big improvement. After that, it doesn't make sense to have uh, four, four centroids, right? That's not going to give me much improvement. Um, let, let's try running this again, right? I'm going to run, run it from the top because sometimes these clusters will tend to overlap each other. So just because... You know, way back here, yeah, I created three clusters. Doesn't mean there's going to be three clear clusters at the end. So let me let me just run this again. <coughs> and um, here, right, it's not as clear. Is that two clusters or three clusters? And uh, and not surprisingly, well, there's less benefit going from two to three. Let, let me just try running it a couple more times. Get some more intuition here. Okay, so that, that it's very clear that we want to go to three. Uh, I want to see one where it's really overlapping, but it's kind of a matter of luck here. What about that one? Not so much benefit going from two to three, right? Because these two are overlapping each other um, so much, right? Okay, so that's what you'll often want to do. So one of the use cases for these things is that you will create a plot like this just so you can say, something about your data. You can say how many kind of distinct clusters um, there are. And that, that of course, is a matter of, of, of prediction. Next time, I'm going to be talking about how we can do, um, where was my notes? What are the uses for these transformations? Why might we want to get data about the distance to each of the clusters? In the last couple of videos, we've been looking at how we can use k-means to identify how many clusters there are um, in the data, and that can be useful in and of itself. Um, another common strategy is that we'll use k-means as pre-processing uh, for another stage in our pipeline. And, and more generally, right, you might apply some unsupervised learning technique like k-means or principal component analysis uh, to create better inputs for a supervised technique, um, for example, logistic uh, regression. Right, so I'm going to do that here, and I've I've really tried to create data that um, will really make this work well, and so here I you can see on the left both my training data and my test data on the right, and um, and what you can see in the training data is that I've created five clusters here, and uh, these clusters are kind of right on top of each other, and um, out of the five clusters, four of them have black dots. And one of them has gray dots. And other than that, there's just gray dots kind of randomly distributed um, throughout the space. And then on the right, we want to predict that. And so clearly there are some patterns here. For example, um, as a human, I might predict that these are in a similar area as this cluster of black dots over here. Um, so I'd probably guess that these are, are black. And then other dots, right? Like if I'm saying in this space right here, those are probably gray because in the training data, those were gray. And so certainly it would be hard to draw a single line that separates the black dots from the gray dots uh, for the purposes of a logistic regression. So we're going to have to do some sort of pre-processing. Okay, so I'm going to create my pipeline down here. Uh, P is a pipeline. And, uh, and a pipeline is just a list of steps. And uh, the last step, the most important one, may be a logistic regression. Like so. And, um, and the first one is going to be standard scaling. Standard scalar, like so. And then eventually I'm going to add in uh, k-means uh, as a pre-processing step to help logistic regression uh, work better. And so I'm going to do this. I'm going to fit my model, so p.fit. And um, what do I want to fit to? Well, I've already taken my data frame up here and split it into training and test data. And, um, and I can see that my two input columns are x0 and x1. So I'm going to just put those in a variable here. I'm going to say x columns is x0 and x1. And then my y column I'm trying to predict is just y. And so I'm going to predict um, on the training data, or fit on the training data, those x columns. And I'm going to compare that to my y column. 
And, and then after I do that, I want to score. How well does this um, classifier work? So I'm going to score it on my testing data. And so I run that, and I see it's not doing very well. Right? It's only getting about 63% correct uh, because it's hard to separate those black dots uh, from the gray dots. And, um, and that's because when I just have a regular logistic regression, it has to only put a straight line there. So if I introduce k-means as a pre-processing step, let's try that. I create k-means here. And, um, and, and let me specify the number of clusters. I'll say n clusters equals, um, let's say, 3 first. Let me try running that. And, uh, and uh, oh, what, what happened there? Um, I have an extra parenthesis just kind of randomly. There we go. That's where it's supposed to be. Excuse me. Okay, so still not very good because there's not enough clusters here, right? I guess the original there are five clusters. If I try jumping up to five, uh, you can see that I'm doing significantly better. But if I go up to something like 10, uh, better still, right? I can kind of capture the different areas and realize how close they are. So having more clusters when I'm doing this pre-processing um, is generally not going to be as problematic as having two a uh, few clusters. So what's happening here when I'm taking the input variables to this? Well, I'm using this k-means uh, step on the data, right? So what this is outputting is the distance to each of those 10 clusters that I identified, right? So I might know as one of my variables, well, what is the distance to this cluster here? And of course, if that distance is small, then it's probably a, a black point. I might also have another column that says, well, what is the distance to this cluster here? Um, if that's small, well, then it's actually probably a, a gray point. Um, so this is one way to do the pre-processing. Um, an alternative, which probably works just as well, would be uh, polynomial features could also um, could also kind of figure out that more complex boundary between the black and the gray.